Live from the 607, it's the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour, where we're talking everything going on in the world of sports. Join in the conversation on social media with the hashtag ODPH, because here we go. Welcome to the last edition of the ODPH podcast in 2023. Say it ain't so, Pad. Uh, this is true. I, I was kind of concerned. I'm like, wait, that can't be right. Looked at the calendar. No, you're right. Sure enough, we have reached the end of the road for 2023. My name is Ken M. You know me as the host of the ODPH podcast. I'm also Nerd Initiatives Comics Editor-in-Chief. To my right in studio, you know him as the co-host of the ODPH. His name, get ready for it, get ready for it is padawan J? let me talk to you yeah uh no ndas on this end of the spectrum exactly just just want to say we we signed all the paperwork we're aware of what we signed (laughs) uh there were no ndas involved so you know lawyers and jim Cornette, you can calm down uh definitely uh yeah pad is no strings attached to him of what he can and cannot say this is true he has a live mic and that's what makes it always interesting podcast content and we definitely have a lot to talk to you in this last edition of the odph for 2023 but obviously we have a lot of stuff planned for 2024 so pat if everyone wants to know about what's going on with the odph where do they go odphpodcast.com right on swing on over there check out the t public store links sale is going on right now as we speak so it's a great time to go get some odph swag for the new year also check out the social media links everything's been updated we talked to everybody throughout the year 365 or 366 if it's a leap year we talk to everybody all the time so we definitely like having those conversations after the show before the show it's how we do also check out the patreon link one tier two dollars a month and bonus content is right there's your fingertips or your lobes i guess we should say because it's podcasting i don't know sounds good also the blog section where we do reviews all the time we have some stuff going on besides the show that you definitely want to go check out the directory which has friends of the show such as 3fm podcast dragon master games nerd initiative the classifieds, which I know I just said that backwards, but you know that's why you go to the website. Because Pat, how many providers are we on? Oh, one thousand two hundred and twenty-seven. Exactly. You know, it's the end of the year show because we like to throw those curveballs in to make sure everybody's really paying attention. Because obviously, if you can find us on your favorite podcast player, is our way of saying thank you so much for supporting the brand for the past twelve months. It means the absolute world to us. Because basically, if it's anything and everything that is the Odie page, including a great music section where you can find the bands that support the show and give us their music to play. Uh, commercial free simple swing on over to odphpodcast.com and always remember on social media use the hashtag odphpod kicking off this year end edition of the show well it's football season in the NFL so you know what that means it's locks and leaps time so pad kick us off yeah so we're going to start with one of my locks I chose the Philadelphia Eagles to be to the New York Giants which they did although admittedly it was a lot closer than I thought a it was a lot be. closer Jesus uh, the Phillies there's the Phillies uh, <laughs> right city wrong sport uh, the Eagles excuse me beat the Giants by the final score of 33 to 25 Jalen Hurts 24 38 for 301 yards passing one touchdown one interception tyrod taylor the leading passer for the giants going seven for 16 133 yards one touchdown one interception he came in what would you say what was it about the third quarter late i would say so uh he was he came in because the new york giants decided to bench tommy cutlets tommy devito italian benched on christmas Uh, that's that's a crime against humanity Mm -hmm. uh nine of 16 55 yards passing no touchdowns or interceptions Hmm. uh saquon barkley the leading rusher for the giants with 23 carries 80 yards just one touchdown deandre swift led the way for philly with 20 carries 92 yards one touchdown A.J. Brown led the way with receiving for Philly. Eight, uh, six catches, 80 yards, no touchdowns. Devontae Smith also right there. Four catches, 79 yards, one touchdown. Darius Slayton leading the way for the Giants in receiving with three catches, 90 yards, and one touchdown. Well, this game was a lot closer, as you touched upon, but it's division game. Yeah. You knew the Giants were going to put up a fight. Yeah. Surprising how close it was, but DeVito did not look great coming out of the first half. No. So I understand why they made the change at quarterback. Albeit, though, it does bring up a little bit of controversy, I guess. A little bit. Because what are you going to do moving forward with the rest of the season? You only have two games left. Right. The Giants are now eliminated from any playoff contention. Right. Not that we didn't already know it, but it's the officially done, but mathematically they're out. So the Giants have to come up with a decision. Do you see what you have with DeVito, or do you go back with, with Taylor, and then you see what you get in the draft? Well, don't forget, you got a certain someone that's uh, currently injured coming back next year. 
That'd be one Danny Dimes. Well, you know what? I'm not so sold he comes back. Okay. I could see him getting released. Okay. Not wishing it on right. you, but... Or, or traded. Well, I think the Giants know this season has not gone the way they expected. And a lot of it has to do with their quarterback play. Right. It's more so on their offensive line. Like, let's <laughs> let's be honest about that. Yeah. But you never really hear that when you listen to a lot of the sports media. Right. I mean, and you, you look at the box score, and you wouldn't think there was anything wrong with the offensive line. Tyrod didn't get sacked. DeVito only got sacked the one time. But when you actually sit there and you watch the game film, did they, you know, they only completed six between the two of them, 16 passes on 32 attempts. Now I realize their receiving core isn't, you know, it's not great. It's not great. You know, Slayton, Daniel Bellinger, Darren Waller, Wandale Robinson, Saquon Barkley, and Matt Breda. Like mm-hmm. that, that's not exactly going to, you know, light your Madden ultimate team on fire mm-hmm. and, and win you any championships, but like, it's, it's okay, you know, but you can clearly tell that like, they don't have any time. To, to to get the pass off. And I, and I really got a question, and now maybe they said something in a post-game press conference or they've said something in the days since this game took place. I don't know why they decided to bench DeVito because, yeah, he didn't have the greatest game, 9-16-55, like I mentioned, no touchdowns. But, like, that's not awful. If, if it was like, oh, yeah, 3 of 16 for, like, 15 yards passing and, you know, no touchdowns or intercept and, like, two interceptions, I'd be like, all right, I get it. That's an awful stat line. But it much like DeVito's father said, you know, hey, no interceptions. So you got to figure out what you got. You know, like you said, do you want to stick with DeVito? Do you want to stick with Tyrod? Or do you want to, you know, have him duke it out, you know, in the uh, upcoming uh, preseason next year uh, when, when Daniel Jones is ready to go? You know, I, I, I'm not saying it's as, it's as egregious as what the Dolphins did with Tua. Mm-hmm. It makes about as much sense as what the Dolphins did with Tua. Well, the the argument that you have to have is they're down 20 to 3 at halftime. Right. If you're trying to salvage this game for reasons, and uh-huh. I mean it's pride. You yeah. you know you want to yeah. win every game you're in. So I understand, but now this causes a little bit of chaos for your locker room. Yeah. Because with two games left, clearly left out of the playoffs. Oh yeah. I'm sure it's just year-end incentives that are going to play a big factor. Probably. Which, listen, it's a business at the end of the day. We all forget about this when we talk sports. Who's going to give you the better chance to hit some incentives? Right. Taylor or DeVito? <laughs> Neither hand was hot. Exactly. Like, Taylor came in, threw a great pass to Slayton, but after that it was like, mm, okay. I'll be honest. I, w- I was busy when this game was going on, but I didn't even realize they took DeVito out until Tyrod went for a run, got hit, after he slid, which caused a fight between the two teams. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, shit, DeVito just took a shot. And then I looked, and then I was watching the replay, and I'm like, wait a minute, that's not DeVito, that's not a 15 on his jersey. Yeah. I'm like, wait a minute, that's Tyrod. I was like, what the fuck is Tyrod doing in here? like I said, they went in, and they're really just trying to say, okay, who's going to give us the best chance to win? Mm -hmm. And I'm sure Dabble and company want to have – a strong ending to the season. A, a, a nice one, at the least. Well, you have to give yourself some confidence going into the draft. Yeah. That's the only thing that you can really say at this stage. Because well, it, it, you got to figure at this point, it's it's just, you know, asset assessment. Oh, of course. You know, figure out what you need for the draft and maybe free agency. And I think the, the statement made here is DeVito is not going to be the future of the Giants. No. Which is perfectly fine. Because like we said, 9 of 16 for 55 isn't great, but it's not awful you know it, it, it to me it's not bench worthy it, it's suspect you know it's not good it's not good but it all falls back on what do you want to do going into your off season right and i think that what dabble and company are looking at is tyrod gives us the best chance to win the devito experiment is over yeah the daniel jones one i think is gone could be because i think at this stage Unfortunately, in his case, it just never panned out in New York. Well, and and we said this when he was drafted. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we've go back and listen to the litany of episodes where we've talked about the Giants, and it just didn't make sense. Like, okay, he had great numbers in college, but he was playing in the ACC at Duke. Mm-hmm. When's the last time the ACC was a powerhouse conference in college football? Sorry, I'll wait. 
You know, the the interesting thing is going to be with this is there's <laughs> a lot of money on this contract. Four years, $160 million. Oh, by the way, it's the first year of the, of the deal. He's got it for next year. It's uh, based out. So it's relatively friendly this year. You mm-hmm. know, base salary of well, just over a million dollars. Signing bonus of $9 million. $500,000 workout bonus. You know, restructure, you know, $2.1 million. Uh, fifteen million dollar cap hit, you know, whatever else. Next year, base salary thirty five point five million dollars. Exactly. That's- now, there is a potential out after the following season or in the twenty twenty five season, you know, which would make it two years eighty two million. But if it's if he doesn't take that out, well, then you're on the hook for thirty million dollars in twenty twenty five for a base salary and forty six point five million dollars in twenty twenty six. No, that's why I say he's which gonna be is gone. asinine. Yeah, he's going to be gone. So either they'll cut him or they'll trade him for pieces. Well, they're going to have to try getting some kind of value for him. Oh, yeah. It's just at this stage, what team is willing to take a flyer on, let's face it, a backup? Oh, Pittsburgh might take a look at it if, if they don't like what they got. Tennessee, I could see that because I'm just looking at the teams. Tennessee would be a good Ten- fit for him. Tennessee, I could see it. Raiders, maybe, if, if they don't get their, their quarterback situation figured out. Oh, looking at the rest of the, they're not going to trade him to the NFC, rest of the NFC East. There's just no chance of that. Well, I don't think the NFC East needs you, a quarterback there. You know, Falcons maybe. Falcons, Falcons need a lot of work. Fa- Falcons need a lot of work, but it could be something to start with. I mean, if they can work out the money, yeah, that would be a great landing spot for them you too. Know, and, and you know, Seattle maybe if if they're not if they don't stick with Geno because I I don't know how long Geno's deal is. Uh, I, I think Geno's deal is three years, but the yeah. thing with them is they're at least in playoff contention. I would say because the rest of the NFC South, I mean, Carolina's got uh, uh, their guy for a couple of years because he's oh the, Bryce Young, yeah, Bryce, he's they got Bryce Young for a couple of years because he's on the rookie deal. Saints have got Derek Carr, so they're set. Tampa Bay's got uh, Baker. Mm. I'm, I'm Detroit, no Green Bay, no Minnesota, probably not. Dark Horse, maybe? You never know with them. You know, you never know. You know, AFC North, okay, Baltimore, ha. Huh. You know, Cincy, <laughs> no. Uh, Cleveland, doubt they can afford it. P- P- like I said, Pittsburgh, sure. Houston, no, I think they're happy with C.J. Stroud. Indianapolis, eh, maybe. Well, that's what I say. There's few landing spots he can yeah. go to. There's, but. It's, it, it, if he gets cut and or traded, it's going to be like some bizarre team that – at the time when it gets announced, it doesn't make sense, but then you think about it, you go, no, you know what, that makes sense. Patriots. God, I hope not. You never know. Please no. Like I said, we haven't spent a lot of time talking about Philly, but this was division. Jalen Hurts did not have a great game. Concerning a little bit. Alarming to a degree, yeah. but, but not DEFCON 5. Yeah, no, the, the, war, the warning alarms are definitely going off, but it's not, you know, red alert status to borrow a phrase from Star Trek. Mm-hmm. I think if what Philly has to do is just regroup for the next two games mm-hmm. and then – worry about the playoffs where you're going to be. That's going to be the only question that they need to do is get Hertz and company. This was a good win for them, but they need yeah. to make sure they stay on track. Yeah, no, definitely a good bounce back for them. Uh, so looking at the schedule for these two teams, the final two weeks of the regular season, this upcoming Sunday, the Philadelphia Eagles are at home against the Arizona Cardinals. And then week 18 on the road playing the New York Giants. Hmm. Uh, and then for the New York football Giants, this upcoming Sunday, they are at home playing the Los Angeles Rams. And then, as I mentioned before, uh, week 18, they're at home against the Philadelphia Eagles. Well, interesting final game of the season. I wouldn't doubt if Philly clinches, they're going to be yeah. sitting starters. But obviously, in the position they are right now with Dallas, mm-hmm. I don't think they can. But if they can definitely sit some people, I think they're going to sit some people. Could be. For the Giants, well, they got to just finish strong and then see what happens in the draft. Mm-hmm. And the other game I took a flyer on because, surprisingly, Dallas was uh, underdogs in this game, uh, was the Dallas Cowboys against the Miami Dolphins, where the Miami Dolphins won by the final score of 22-20. to 20. Uh, Tua Tagovailoa, 24-37, 293 yards passing, one touchdown, no interceptions. Dak Prescott, 20-32, 253 yards passing, two touchdowns, and no interceptions. Tony Pollard led the way in Dallas for rushing with 12 carries, 38 yards, no touchdowns. Raheem Moster led the way for Miami in rushing with 11 carries, 46 yards, no touchdowns. Uh, for receiving, it was who? Tyreek Hill. Nine catches, 99 yards, no touchdowns. Uh, and C.D. Lamb led the way for Dallas in receiving with six catches, 118 yards, and just one touchdown. Well, this one, Dallas should have won. Mm-hmm. Easily. Miami snuck one out. Yeah, I was like, because outside of Tyreek, obviously the running game, 
neither side had much going. No. You know, Moster, I mentioned 46. Devon uh, Kane, 24 yards. Jeff Wilson Jr., 21 yards. Jalen Waddle had two rushing yards. Tua had negative two. You know, so and, and it was kind of the same on Dallas. 38 for Pollard, 25 for Dak. C.D. Lamb had 14. Cooks had nine. Uh, Cavante Turpin had four. Rico Dowdle had four. Hunter uh, Lupica had three. So obviously the run game, not at a premium there. But when you look at the rest of the Miami receiving, you know, 99 yards for Hill. For Hill. Then you have 56 uh, yards, 50, 42, 19, 12, 7, 4, and 4. Mm-hmm. Like, fairly easy game plan, I would say. You know, double cover Tyreek Hill and let the other guys try and beat you. Well, Dallas had a good game plan going. And they were matching up to Miami very well. Mm-hmm. And especially with the speed that Miami has at the wide receiver position. I'll be at the Waddle banged up in this one. So we don't know the status of him moving forward. And Tyreek Hill is questionable as we're recording right now. This is true. Uh, currently sitting at 1,641 yards uh, receiving. So uh, the potential of hitting that 2,000-yard uh, record, possible, not easy, though. It's not easy considering their next two games. But for Miami, they need to focus on winning those two games. Jesus Christ, who the fuck isn't questionable on this team? Exactly. Good God. They are hurt at the wrong time. Tyreek uh, Tua, questionable. Tyreek, questionable. Uh, Andrew Van Ginkle, one of their linebackers, questionable. Xavier Howard, the cornerback, questionable. Guard, Austin Jackson, questionable. They got an offensive tackle, Liam Eichenberg, questionable. Devon Akane, Questionable. Teron Armstead, one of their tackles, offensive tackles. Questionable. Waddle, questionable. Moster, questionable. Robbie Chosen, wide receiver, questionable. Good God. Yeah, I know they are hurt at the wrong time. And, and that's just from today as we record. Mm-hmm. You go back into d- the, the 26, you got another one, two, three, four different guys on this team who are, who are all questionable. Mm-hmm. Holy crap. Exactly. So they didn't come out of this game unscathed. No. To say it mildly. And this is the worst possible situation they could have had. Yeah. Granted, a gritty come from behind win Mm -hmm. because Dallas was up late too. Dallas I'd be a little more concerned with because they couldn't make a key stop when they needed to. Uh Uh-huh. And there is some work to be done here, but I also feel Miami – Showed some grit. Oh, yeah. I will give them all credit in the world for this one. Yeah. Albeit, though, I did not like the officiating in this game mm-hmm. on both sides. But more so, I thought Miami had a lot more favorable flags in their direction. Right. Just happened to be what it is. Right. You know, but this is you have this in every game you play that just sometimes it just seems like things were going in a certain direction. Not saying anything was funny with the games. Right, right. But right. it was just like it just kind of seemed weird that Dallas couldn't catch a break when they needed to. Especially, I know the meme was going around about Micah Parsons yeah. and how much he was getting held, yeah. and that was not getting called. Now, granted, it's tough to say that on defense, but it is what it is. Right. But like I say, just doing the optic test, it was just like, hmm. Things just kind of seemed to line up for Miami, mm-hmm. and they took advantage. And, like, listen, they did what a good team does. Yeah, they win. It ain't always pretty, but, hey, they won. No, but they showed a gritty comeback because I know the knock on them this season has been – they can't beat teams over 500. Hey, they beat one over 500. They did with Dallas. And now you have to question for both of them moving forward, Dallas, what does this do to their psyche as they go play forward? Well, so, I mean, you look at the uh, regular standings. Mm-hmm. Uh, the NFC East still not decided. Obviously, Philly and Dallas have both clinched a playoff spot. Giants and Commanders, hey, thanks for playing. But the division isn't decided yet, so that's currently up in the air. You look at the – if the playoffs were to start today you know, or this weekend as we record, Philadelphia Eagles would be a number two seed uh, playing the Seattle Seahawks. And obviously, you know, division winner, they'd host, they'd host that game. Mm-hmm. And then uh, after that, it would be the Dallas Cowboys taking on the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in a four-seed versus five-seed matchup. Hmm. That could make for an interesting dynamic. Uh-huh. So we'll have to kind of wait to see. The, the the concerning one for me, though, you mentioned is Miami being banged up at the wrong time. If they don't get, obviously they're not going to be 100% because mm-hmm. at this point in the season, who the hell is, what team is 100% oh, right. on every player? Right. But, again, looking at the playoff, st- or the playoff bracket, if it were to start this weekend, Miami would be playing Indianapolis and that would- in a two-versus-seven seed. Now, a healthy or near healthy Miami should be Miami all day. Mm-hmm. But with Miami as banged up as they are, 
if you got Tyreek ain't able to go 100% or close to 100%, you got Waddle who ain't able to go close to 100%, and then you got a couple other your offensive weapons not able to go close to 100%, I wouldn't doubt Indy sneaking that one out. You know, playoffs, any given Saturday, Sunday, whatever you want to say. Anything could happen yeah. there. But, yeah. but the bigger dynamic that you have to watch is the Buffalo Bills. hey And not saying this as my team, but just saying this in general. Mm-hmm. If the Bills win next week against New England, right, and Miami loses against Baltimore, right, the game on Week 18 is now for the division of the AFC East. Yeah. And if Miami has to travel, <laughs> oh god, that could be detrimental to them. Oh boy. Especially if they have to go to upstate New York. And it is that time of year. Well, so if if looking at the playoff standings, currently, as I mentioned, Miami's playing Indianapolis. Mm-hmm. Buffalo's playing Kansas City. So if we even flop those two, let's just play. Let's just say everybody else stays pat. Nothing else changes. Sure. Just for the sake of simplicity and not getting everyone at home confused. But if everyone else stays pat, so, okay, you just flip Buffalo and Miami. Well, then Miami would be going to Kansas City, mm-hmm. which uh, Kansas City and Fucking January, have fun with that one. Yeah, and then Buffalo would be playing uh, Indianapolis. They'd be hosting. They'd be, they'd be hosting Indianapolis. Oy. That's what I say. If Miami has to go to Kansas City, right? Kansas City at home is very tough to beat at home. Although I'll be honest, they looked a little light in uh, attendance on Sunday. Well, or Monday or whatever. We'll it was. get into that when we talk about that game. But if Miami has to go there, they're in problems. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And especially if, and if they if they go have to go to Kansas City, they have to be close to 100 mm-hmm. percent. Yeah, there, that's, there's no if ands or buts about it. Exactly, because with as bad as Kansas City is still playing, it's still Kansas City at home. Uh huh. And like I say, at home cooking. They like I say, they do very very well at home. Also, we know how Floridians do with winter weather. Mm-hmm. Not a shot. It's a fact. It is what it is. I got family in Florida, so I'm excused. But like I say, for as as gritty as Miami played, and yeah. like I say, they were getting away with a lot of stuff too, though. Yeah. So it is what it is. I'm yeah. not. I'm, I'm not saying anything was wrong with the officiating. I'm just saying a lot of things were not called, in my mm-hmm. opinion. Mm-hmm. This was a game that they snuck that they shouldn't have won. Yep. And they came out of it though very very hurt yeah and now with the two weeks uh next week against baltimore the yep. following week against the bills yep they need to pull some magic together wouldn't doubt if that uh buffalo game depending on how next week goes because every game in week 18 is to be determined on what time they're playing obviously mm-hmm. would not be surprised if that's like the prime that if that's oh, they'll get time. flexed well they, there's nothing to flex nothing's right, right. decided but right they'll name but they'll name that the late game they'll put they'll, they'll put that one on later so you mentioned the Dolphin schedule, looking at the Dallas Cowboys in the next couple of weeks. Uh, they're actually playing on Saturday this upcoming week. Uh, they're at home against the Detroit Lions. That will be at 8.15 p.m. on ESPN and ABC and ESPN+. Plus. And then uh, week 18 on Sunday, January 7th, they're on the road playing the Washington Commanders. Bum, 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 bum. So potentially playing everybody, potentially sitting everyone week 18. We'll see. We'll have to see. We'll have to wait and see. But as you mentioned, those Detroit Lions. hmm Pulled out a gritty win, Ooh. and I love what Dan Campbell and the team has created a culture up there, and it showed here against a division rival that, in you know we we always said every week and go what team are we going to get like this they're not as bad as the Chargers concerning this, but it's a statement that when you say about the Minnesota Vikings and all the talent they have mm-hmm. and how they might even get into the playoffs yeah. They still can't find a way to get it together. This was a great win for Detroit. Pat, let's talk about it. Yeah, so the Detroit Lions beat the Minnesota Vikings by the final score of 30-24. to 24. Jared Goff, 30-40, of 40, 257 yards passing, one touchdown, no interceptions. Uh, Nick Mullins got the start for Minnesota, going 22-36, 411 yards passing, two touchdowns, four interceptions. Yeah. Yikes. Yeah. Ty Chandler led the way in rushing for Minnesota with eight carries, 17 yards, one touchdown. 
Jameer Gibbs led the way for Detroit with 15 carries, 80 yards, two touchdowns uh, for Detroit. And receiving it was Amon Ross St. Brown with 12 catches, 106 yards receiving, and one touchdown. And on Minnesota, it was, who else? Justin Jefferson with six catches, 141 yards receiving, and one touchdown. Oh, by the way, should mention, uh, with this win, the Detroit Lions uh, clinched the NFC North for the first time since... 1993. Yeah. Well, back then it was the NFC Central. Right. But They this, won the division. Right, but they won their division first time since that date. Yeah, yeah. Insane to think about, but like I say, you have to give Dan Campbell all the credit in the world. Uh-huh. If it's not him instilling this, and he, and I, I forget what show it was. I want to say it was on ESPN. Okay. They were showing, or maybe it was McAfee, they were showing the old press uh, announcements when he came into the press conference. Right, right. Uh, uh, probably McAfee. And was saying about what he was going to do. And sure enough, uh, everything, yeah, it was McAfee. Uh, so credit yeah. to the Pat McAfee show. Everything he said came to fruition. Yeah. And this is something Detroit has needed. They have an identity. Uh huh. They have the right players coming to the team. They've instilled a culture of winning. Uh huh. This team never gives up, and granted, they might not win every game, but you know they're in every game. Mm -hmm. And for a city that is begging for something. I was say, because Christ, the Pistons ain't giving it to you. Oh, the NBA, yeah, the Pistons, we'll, we'll talk about that in a, in, a, in a while. Detroit is starving for something to get excited about, uh -huh. and this team is giving it to them. They're fun to watch. Yeah. Jared, Jared Goff. Is playing with a chip on his shoulder. He's playing very good football. Yeah, Jameer Gibbs is like just showing up and showing out. He's proving everybody why he was drafted so high, and he's really making himself into an NFL star. Yeah, and that defense though is playing absolutely lights out. Anzalone, and of course, you know we always think you know. Who else? Hutchinson. Mm -hmm. Just absolutely playing great football. And having those you know, core pieces in place, you're seeing the effects on them. Yeah. Uh, some fun facts I, I dug up. The last time the Detroit Lions won their division, of course I mentioned it was uh, 1993, Bill Clinton was in his first year in office as president. Mm -hmm. The highest grossing film that year, the first Jurassic Park movie. Mm. Rudy had just hit the box office. Gas prices were, and you're going to love this price, $1.11. Oh. Jared Goff, their starting quarterback, was not even born. Hmm. Uh, Michael Jordan took it personally that Charles Barkley was NBA MVP. I do remember that. Uh, the number one song on the charts that year, I Will Always Love You by Whitney Houston. And the head coach, current head coach of the Detroit Lions, Dan Campbell, was still in high school fucking crazy it's, it's insane to think about but when you have a franchise that, i mean let's face it detroit has always had a losing franchise with yes. that football team yes to see somebody come in turn it around and and have the players buy in and that is the hardest thing to do at the pro level mm -hmm. when you see players buying in at the pro level to what you're trying to say and saying we can win we can beat anybody and to see him go out on the field and do this, especially against a division rival, and like we touched upon, division rival games, anything can happen. Mm -hmm. To see them go in, win gritty, this is a beautiful thing. Oh, absolutely. And for Minnesota. Hey, still in it, but not helping that TJ Hawkinson is on injured reserve for the year. He's out for the year but with a torn ACL and MCL. Yeah, that hurts big. That, you're, you're still in it mathematically. You know, you're 7 and 8. Obviously, you're not winning the division, but you are. Uh, ahead of the Atlanta based on head to head win percentage. So you're still in eighth you're still in eighth place. So you still got a shot, but Hawkinson going down ain't helping. Definitely not helping. And for Justin Jefferson, you can see the frustration is boiling now. Uh-huh. So what's Minnesota his, his contract with? Minnesota is going to have some problems there. And it's not to say he's been disruptive, but you can see that he is literally trying to do everything he can to help this team win. Uh huh. And he's just not getting any support. Ooh, Justin Jefferson on the third of his four year contract. Mm hmm. Oh, God, the fucking base salary next year. Holy fuck. 2.3, now almost $2.4 million. We're a couple hundred dollars short of 2.4. So we'll just say 2.4. Next year, $19.7 million yeah. base. Holy fuck. Yeah, and obviously he's earning it. Oh, absolutely. Without question, he's in the conversation if he's not the best wide receiver in football. I'm calling it now. After next year, unless they trade him, he's gone. 
Oh, I think so too. He, he's gone. I think he's going to try sticking it out and then take his chances on the free agent market because, I mean, they, yeah, they, oh, he'll get paid. Yeah, otherwise they just have to franchise him, but then that's going to be absorbing it too. Uh huh. So it will be interesting to see where he ends up, but if they don't get some help around him, yeah, he's, he's gone. Oh, yeah. And it's a scary thought for Vikings fans to think about. Well, they're used to it. But you have to think if he wasn't there, he'd be in Buffalo. That's true. Because that was the most equal trade in NFL history. At least that I can think of. Yeah. That was equal value. Even the one that the Bills did with Kansas City to get Patrick Mahomes to Kansas City was very equal right. at the time. Right. Albeit, though, some players have left since then. But still, at the time, it yeah. was it was yeah. there. But this one, I mean, this was the trade deal for Stefan Diggs. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like I say, it was it was equaled out. Unfortunately, though, it hasn't worked out in Minnesota's favor because they just can't get consistent play at quarterback and their defense. <laughs> I'm on a lot of just, other things. Yeah, like I say, you, you, can, you can just – pick a topic out of a hat and there yeah. you go with Minnesota. Yeah, really. Just all the talent in the world but can't put it together. No, nope. uh looking at these two teams schedule the final two weeks of the regular season for the Detroit Lions as I alluded to before they're playing this Saturday on the road against the Dallas Cowboys. That'll be at 8:15 p.m. on ABC, ESPN and ESPN Plus. Uh week 18 they're at home against the Minnesota Vikings. Hmm. Uh and then for the Minnesota Vikings this upcoming Sunday they are on Sunday Night Football 8:20 p.m. on NBC uh at home against the Green Bay Packers. Well, and then uh, week uh, 18, as I alluded to, uh, with the Detroit Lions, they're on the road playing the Detroit Lions. Well, I was going to say, I think the only reason they can't flex out of that is just because it's old school tradition. Oh, yeah. So I think, and obviously with New Year's Eve. Uh, Yeah, yeah. You know, they're just, they're not going to mess around with that. Yeah. Plus, plus it should be at least a halfway decent game. Well, it's division, so you know they'll show up. So at least they'll get something out of it this late. Yep. Much like those Cleveland Browns. Good God have been making some noise, and dare I say, they might be the scariest team going into the AFC playoffs. Uh Uh-huh. Maybe, just maybe, Joe Flacco is going to lead them somewhere. Career resurgence, question mark? I tell you what, it's going to be a great movie when it's all said and done, depending on how Cleveland does. Comeback player of the year, question mark? Oh, I think so easily. I think you have to (laughs) after this game. Talk about it. Yeah, so the Cleveland Browns defeated the Houston Texans by the final score of 36-22. to Joe Flacco, 27-42, 368 yards passing, three touchdowns, two interceptions. Uh, Leading passer for Houston was Davis Mills going 15-32, 149 yards passing, two touchdowns, no interceptions. Case Keenum got some time in as well, 11 11 for 17, 62 yards, no touchdowns, two interceptions. Uh, Name you're all too familiar with, Devin. Singletary, nine carries, mm-hmm. 44 yards, no touchdowns. Sounded like his Buffalo days. Yep. Uh, Cleveland, it was Jerome Ford, 15 carries, 25 yards, one touchdown. Normally I stick with the Cleveland receiving because I'm going like I'm bouncing around in, in team order here. i got to just leave Cleveland receiving for last for obvious reasons. Mm-hmm. Uh, Houston leading receiver was Dalton Schultz, eight, car- eight catches, 61 yards, no touchdowns. Leading receiver for Cleveland, Mari Cooper. Uh, fantasy owners, you must be doing backflips. 11 catches, 265 yards <laughs> receiving, two touchdowns. His longest, he's 75-yard catch. He averaged 24.1 yards a catch. No, he had a day. Oh, my Lord. He had a day. Targeted 15 times, so he only missed or dropped four passes. Good Cle- God. Cleveland's finding a way to do it. And Cooper having a career day. Holy shit. It's it's big. Where the hell was this when I had him on fantasy? Like last I said, year? career day all day. But this is a situation that if the Browns can stay hot, they're going to make some noise in the playoffs. So many cue the memes. This is why I'm hot. Well, you have to think about it though. Flacco has given him stability at quarterback. Right. Now, granted, he's not playing at an elite level, right? Because he's averaging at least one interception, if not more, a game. Well, I mean, it is what it is. Yeah. But if it ain't pretty, but hey, it's working. They're winning. Yeah. And that's the only stat anybody cares about, and that's the only one they should care about. The fact that with all the injuries and drama surrounding the Browns this season. Yeah. The fact they're ten and five in the playoffs is the story. And they're still mathematically in it for the division. Yeah. Baltimore's clinched a playoff spot. They haven't won the division yet. Now Baltimore currently twelve and three. Cleveland ten and five. 
So fear and and I was curious because I'm like, well, what was their? Rec- I'm like, all right, well, what's Cleveland playing the rest of the season? Are they playing Baltimore the rest of the season? No, they've already played Baltimore this year. They split the, the mm-hmm. games one and one. So th- without knowing the further shenanigans of like how they break down who wins the division, there's still a shot if Baltimore loses out and Cleveland wins out that Cleveland could end up with the division win. Yeah, which is fucking wild. It's insane to think about. It really is. But Cleveland is defying odds right now. Yeah. Their defense is playing at such a high astronomical level. Three-game winning streak. They beat Jacksonville, Chicago, and obviously Houston. Mm-hmm. And they're winning ugly, too. Oh, yeah. like See, They're not blowouts. They beat Jacksonville 31-27, Chicago 2017, and then, as I mentioned, Houston 36-22. Yeah. Their, their biggest, like, blowout win of the year was uh, well, you had Tennessee, they beat 27 to three, mm-hmm. and then they beat Arizona 27 to nothing. Yeah. Like, that's the biggest blowout they've had this year. Right. They're not going to scare you, but, no. they're, but they're going to hang with you, and they're going to stay until that last round. They'll, and they'll punch you in the mouth. That's for damn sure. Yeah. And even with Houston putting out 15 points in the fourth quarter, they still held on. Two, two interceptions, three sacks for uh, Cleveland's defense. Yeah. Their defense is the story with this team. But Flacco giving them a, a steady arm at quarterback, that's a big deal. Six QB hits. Yeah. Like I say, they're finding ways to make this happen, and that's why if they get in those playoffs, like I say, it's going to be scary for whoever's got to face in first round. Uh, currently, as uh, if the playoffs were to start this weekend, that would be uh, Jacksonville. i take Cleveland in a heartbeat. Yeah, I would too. Jacksonville does not scare me. Not Sorry, right now. Sorry, folks. Yeah, not right now. On the flip of the coin, though, Houston – I mean, but, hey, you you're doing fairly. You're eight and seven, which is better than we figured you'd be. Oh, absolutely. But you know, the CJ Stroud's out. That's the that's the story with them. Yeah. If CJ Stroud was in there, different yeah. deal. Yeah. You know, that's the easiest way to describe them. Yeah. But the fact that they're still in games, it's a testament to the yeah. to the players around them that they're trying to rally and make, still make something happen. Yeah, and, and I mean, you got a decent thing going. You got a good quarterback. It looks like maybe get a better run game. You know, the running game isn't obviously anything because once you get past Devin Singletary's forty four yards. It's a dr- it's a drop. It's a drop. You know, nine yards from Davis Mills, seven yards from Robert Woods, uh, six yards from Dare Ogunbowale, mm-hmm. uh, and six yards from Damian Pierce. Yeah. Uh, so that's a drop. So maybe get a better run game, uh, offensive line, obviously. You know, and then maybe some pieces on defense, and you know, you might have something cooking there. So with Stroud there, they're going to get some free agents to pay more attention. Yeah. yeah so I yeah. think you'll you'll see a big upgrade with them next season. But I think for right now, they just got to see what they can do this season. Yeah. Uh, Looking at these two teams' schedules for the final two weeks of the regular season, this upcoming Thursday, uh, the Cleveland Browns are at home playing the New York Jets, so that will obviously be on Prime Video. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then Week 18, they're on the road playing the uh, Cincinnati Browns. Cincinnati Browns. Yeah. Cincinnati Bengals. Uh, For the Houston Texans, this upcoming uh, Sunday, they are at home against the Tennessee Titans, and then they close out the regular season on the road playing the Indianapolis Colts. Hmm. Interesting football to finish out for both teams. Cincinnati could be a sleeper game, though. Could be. Could be. Well, speaking of some other games, let's talk about it, wrapping up this recap. Yeah, so uh, starting with the Thursday game, you had the uh, Los Angeles Rams defeat the New Orleans Saints 30-22. to Rams are deceptively coming back. <laughs> Somehow. Deceptively. Somehow the Rams returned. Yes. Uh, mathematically, let's see. Are they even in it? Eh, yeah. No, yeah, they are. They're currently the sixth seed. Yeah, they're like I said, they they're have the sixth snuck, seed. They have snuck back in. Oh, that's a one and done. They'd be playing Detroit in the first round. I, <laughs> no, well, I'm not. I would say maybe. Like it's it's a sixty forty. It should be Detroit. The thing with them is, Aaron Donald is going to be playing out of his mind and if they have to get into a crazy shootout I Stafford returning home to Detroit yeah. like I'm just saying that game take the over and then see where the the last team is standing I was curious too. see I agree with you but at the same token there's this little tidbit as it currently stands the Detroit Lions are hosting a playoff game in Detroit mm-hmm. has not happened since they lost to the Green Bay Packers on Wild Card Weekend on January eighth, nineteen ninety four. Yeah. So we're talking, you know. What? Oh, that place will be rock. Oh, it'll be deafening in there. But the thing is, with Stafford coming back, like that's the that, sto- that's a storyline. That, that'll be marquee to but, say the least. But like I say, 
he's got the wide receivers. He can make some noise. It will be a real test for Detroit. I would say I wouldn't doubt right. the Rams getting a win, but I'm not going to say they are. I want to see. Right. I want to see how teams are looking if that is the matchup. Sure. Before I officially declare. Uh, then we got to uh, mention the Pittsburgh Steelers beat the Cincinnati Bengals 34 to 11. Well. The Bengals, I think, unfortunately, have come back to earth. This knocked them out of the playoff contention as of right now. Mm -hmm. And this is a bad loss for them. Very Very. much so. I will say, though, if you had George Pickens on your fantasy (laughs) team, and I luckily won my games because I thought I had him in, and I did not. But I luckily did. Four catches, 195 yards, and two touchdowns. But yeah, but we're still going to the Super Bowls for both games. This is the most bad shit stat with this with this uh, game. Jake Browning, twenty eight of forty two, three hundred and thirty five yards passing, one touchdown, three interceptions. Yeah, what the shit? Browning came back to earth in this one, and for Cincinnati, any hope of the playoffs, I think, is dwindling further and further away. Jamar Chase is still out, still in it mathematically, but they're in tenth place. Yeah, they and, uh, they need to win out and have a lot of help. Yeah, so I think, unfortunately, their season is now done. Yep. Uh, the Atlanta Falcons defeated the Indianapolis Colts 29-10. to Who is Atlanta? What is Atlanta? Atlanta got a big win and a crucial blow to the Colts. Still below 500, though. Yes, indeed. <laughs> There's only one team in that entire division close to 500, and that's uh, the Bucs, who are 533. Yes. So, like I say, very bad loss for the Colts. Yeah. Very bad. Yep. Uh, then you had the Seattle Seahawks defeat the Tennessee Titans 20-17. to Well, what can you say? The Seahawks are going to hang until they get kicked out of the bar, so to speak. West Coast team coming east my ass. Yeah. They are not going to disappear out of the playoff picture that easily. No. No way. Geno Smith had a great game and it found a, a gutsy win, mm-hmm. especially Tennessee uh, I hate saying this, but I think you're going to see a lot of moving parts next season. Probably. I think a lot of players are going to get uh, shuffled around, uh, whether they're back with the team or not. So Probably. Uh, interesting to see what happens with Tennessee, but a great win for Seattle. The New York Jets beat the Washington Commanders 30-28. to Bum, 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 what? <laughs> yeah, the most meaningless game on Sunday was bonkers. Yeah. I mean, when we were first looking at this, I don't think anybody was really paying attention. What was it, 27-7 to 7 at halftime? Mm-hmm. The Jets blew that lead, but then still pulled off the win with late-game heroics. Yeah, Brees Hall heck, had a heck of a game. 95 yards on the ground with two touchdowns and 96 in the air. Like, if the Jets could have done this all season, well, it would be a different story. Aaron Rodgers might actually be activated legitimately. Mm, maybe, just maybe. Uh, you uh, had the uh, Green Bay Packers defeat the Carolina Panthers by the final score of 33-30. to 30. This game was way closer than it should have been. For as bad as the Panthers are, yes, oh, it was. Oh, my God. If I, if I uh, Green Bay fans, I understand your pain because watching this, this was rough because mm-hmm. the opportunities that you had to really put this away, scary how quickly it was slipping. Yep. Uh, you had the Tampa Bay Buccaneers defeat the Jacksonville Jaguars 30-12. to 12. Tampa Bay's getting hot at the right time. Gutsy. Very, very gutsy win. So, and loving seeing Baker's remotivated, and I think he's going to be sticking around there for a couple more years. Yeah, that could be. We'll see. I mean, they're currently the number four seed. They'd be playing Dallas in the first round. Obviously, they're the uh, division leaders, although that ain't saying much for that mm-hmm. division. Yeah. Good win for them. No, Baker, I think they might like what Baker's doing and keep him around. I think so, too. Um, at least until the wheels fall off, and then, well, we'll see. Uh, the Chicago Bears defeated the Arizona Cardinals 27-16. to 16. Well, what happens now? Justin Fields played a very good game. Uh huh. Bears still are in a high draft position. Positions. Yeah. Interesting times in Chicago. We'll just leave it at that. Let's say I'm pulling up the draft status here. Obviously, they've still got the number one overall pick by way of Carolina. And their other pick in the first round is at the number eight spot right now. Right. So they're sitting real pretty. Yeah, they definitely are sitting in the driver's seat. So we'll have to wait to see what road they decide to head to because yeah. a lot of options now going into this offseason because obviously their season's done. Yep. Uh, you had the Las Vegas Raiders defeat the Kansas City Chiefs 20-14 to on Christmas Day. Oh, man. Oh, man. Where do we begin here? I'm questioning this fucking attendance figure I'm looking at. Tell you that much based off of the video I was watching. Mm-hmm. Now that might be you know that might be the sold attendance, but from what I saw, the, according to the 
box score on ESPN.com, they had 73,480 folks in attendance. Capacity is allegedly 73,426. Uh, there was not 73,000 people in that stadium when I was watching on, on Monday. Paid attendance versus physical attendance. That's what it's got to be. We've talked about this in wrestling before. <laughs> hey, shout out Jacksonville. Yes. Uh, so that kind of sums that up. Mm-hmm. The Chiefs are spiraling Yep. at the worst time. This is not on Taylor Swift. I know that that rumor has now started. <laughs> I honestly think it's on – obviously there's there's some blame with the Kansas City uh, wide receivers coach. Mm. Good God, they're awful. No, oh, yeah. I think part of it is the expectations NFL fans have put on the Kansas City Chiefs, and I'm not saying this because I'm a Patriots fan, but it's the expectations – NFL fans are putting on the Kansas City Chiefs because of what the Patriots did for 20 years. Yeah. Where you look at the success and how many years they won the division. And everyone said, and it happened for so long and became so regular that whenever a team gets hot like that or successful like that, it's expected that they're going to do it. You know, I think in, you're right about something. I think fans do have an expectation with Kansas City. I think the problem, though, and you hit it right on the head, is their wide receiver core. Uh huh. And the one thing that Patrick Mahomes has always had, he had a great wide receiver in Tyreek Hill. Oh, yeah. They let him go. At the same time, though, won a Super Bowl without him. They did. But when you have a healthy Travis Kelsey, right. he did make up for a lot. Uh huh. Kelsey is getting up there in age. Oh, yeah. And his body is, you know, feeling the effects of playing in the NFL for so long. Right. They need somebody else to give him some balance. They don't have that. When your leading rusher in this game is Patrick Mahomes. Uh, Something's wrong with that. And Pacheo is your second at 26 yards. That's not good. Mm -hmm. So your team is becoming one-dimensional. Yep, and the thing is, Mahomes has played very sloppy. I yeah. guess to agree, if you want to put it a little more nicer, he has been playing very inadequately, right? And he has been very playing a lot more carelessly, mm-hmm. and that is not a good thing if you are a Chiefs fan, right? To be watching because the Raiders were going to get up for this game, and I will stress this until it's deemed he is actually the head coach next season. Mm-hmm. Antonio Pierce has gotten the Raiders ready for this, and their defense came out swinging. Oh, yeah. And took advantage of very costly turnovers. Right. Which does help to turn some points there. And they jumped out to an early, and they never let up. Yep. And they were smart about this. Yep. So Kansas City got exposed. You can see the the – frustration boiling over on the players on the sideline. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying Andy Reid has lost this team. It's unraveling, though. But, but they are starting to slowly unravel. Mm-hmm. And winning is the biggest Band-Aid of all. Uh-huh. I don't think they have any in their medicine cabinet. No. So if they're hoping to pull off that Hollywood ending, they're going to need to turn it around very quickly. Mm-hmm. I just don't know if they can. And it's going to be a situation that if they can do it, yeah, they could make some noise in the playoffs. And I'm not saying that they're not going to, but if they continue to play the sloppy style they've been doing, right, and it has been very, very sloppy, then there's an issue that is going to make them very easy one and done in those playoffs. Mm-hmm. And I know it's going to be interesting to see how they match up, but there's also another stat I want to bring up. Okay. Because this has been driving me nuts for a little bit. Okay. Obviously, you know my stat – as a full-fledged Bills Mafia member. A card-carrying member. Mm-hmm. Okay, so according to our fine folks at ESPN.com, yep. Mr. Josh Allen, 27 throwing touchdowns? Yep. 15 interceptions? Correct. Okay, so we haven't we haven't made any any false claims here? No. This is all statistician. Unless you're looking at, you're listening to this episode a week in the future, in which case those numbers might have changed. Mm-hmm. But as we were recording on December 27th, we'll, yep. we'll give you a peek behind the curtain, as uh, Pat always says. Yeah. Okay, so Mr. Patrick Mahomes. Yes. 26 throwing touchdowns, 14 mm-hmm. interceptions. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So if I'm doing my math right. Near identical. Near identical. Swap swap uh, interception or a touchdown either way, and, well, you got the same stats. Mm-hmm. And we're not talking about Josh's 15 running touchdowns because he's at, like, 40, I believe. Right. We're talking straight-up interceptions. Yep. 
So where is it that Mahomes, you know, is done? The MVP talk is done. You know, all the nonsense that Josh Allen got. I mean, I think for in Patrick's case, I'll speak to Patrick's case. I think a lot of people are saying he's done. It's this, it's that. Because of what he's done the last couple of years, that mm-hmm. did, that he, let me look up how long he's been in the league. Because admittedly, I don't know it off the top of my head. Uh, but you look at Patrick Mahomes, who is drafted in 2017, so he's in his what uh, six year, six year. Mm-hmm. This is going to be the first season in his career where he was the starter, where they didn't win 12 games. Yeah, and it's not. And 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 the thing I've noticed, at least you know, and obviously I'm not a Kansas City fan, sure. But like the thing you don't see on social media and on the sports you know, news shows and talk shows is you don't see the stuff like they were pulling last year against the Raiders where, mm-hmm. where they were doing ring around the Rosie, you know, before they decided to get set and pass the ball. Yeah. There's not the video game like, oh, he's looking left. He shovel passes the ball to the right and somehow they score. There's mm-hmm. not that like video game magic with him. Well, you know why? Why is that? Eric Bedemy has gone. Yeah, that's true. And the receiver in court is shit. Mm-hmm. I mean, I pulled up some numbers here. Obviously, you got Kelsey, who's got 90 catches for the year, 968 yards. All right, that's not that's not bad. Uh, then you've, their next leading receiver is Rasheed, uh, Rasheed Rice, seven, care, seven catches, 811 yards. All right, that's also, you know, not bad. Mm-hmm. Then you get into some of the other ones. Marquez Valdez-Scantling, some, one of the guys they figured, you know what, he might step up with Tyreek Hill gone. 20 catches, 312 yards, one touchdown. Yep. Uh, for this game, he had, let me pull it up here, he had uh, one target, no catches, no yards. Thanks for thanks for showing up. Uh, Justin Watson, who in this game had four catches, 38 yards, one touchdown. Uh, for the year, he's got 26, 419, and three touchdowns. Noah Gray, one of their uh, other tight ends that's not named Travis Kelsey, yeah, yeah, he had an okay game. Uh, well, not really. One catch, five yards on three targets for the year. 25 catches, 288 yards, and two touchdowns. Mm-hmm. Blake Bell, one of their other tight ends, four catches, 23 yards, one touchdown. Then you get into Justin Ross, four catches, 36 yards, no touchdowns. Now, I realize not everyone's going to put up like Tyree, sure. Tyree Hill, Travis Kelsey numbers. But fucking distribute the ball. It's pretty goddamn obvious where you're going to go with the ball these days, and that's Kelsey. Exactly. He's going to a security blanket. Yeah. And that's the problem. The teams are picking up on it, and they're not throwing anybody a different look. They're not doing anything different. Yeah. And this is going to be a problem for the Chiefs if they think they're going to make a run in the playoffs. So they need to figure it out quickly if they're going to do this. But this is a great win for Antonio Pierce. Yeah. And if the Raiders let him go, it's a travesty. But he, mark my words, he will be a head coach somewhere else mm-hmm. next season. Enough said. Yeah, and like I said, there's a very real possibility Kansas City will be playing a road game this year. I can't wait. It's entirely possible. I'm excited to see that because there's no way there's no way unless they fall apart and somehow slip to like a four or five seed or some shit. They're currently three. Mm-hmm. So even you know the low seed plays Baltimore in the divisional round. So regardless, the only way they would possibly play a road game, I think, would be if Miami beats Indy. Because Miami's the two, Kansas City be the three, and then if and then if, uh, either Jackson and if, in that scenario, either Jacksonville or Cleveland, whoever wins that game and go on to play Baltimore, because the low seed plays Baltimore. Mm-hmm. So if so if Miami beats Kansas City, it'd be Kansas City going to Miami. Yeah, a lot of interesting scenarios to happen here, but I just can't wait to see if Kansas City has to travel. Yeah, uh, and then the other one we got to get to before we talk about our games uh, was the Baltimore Ravens beating the San Francisco 49ers 33-19. to This one can be very easily summed up. Okay. Baltimore defense understands that if a pass, if it looks like Purdy's going to throw, they throw their hands up mm-hmm. and something could happen. A lot of those passes were deflections. The offensive line for San Francisco played atrociously. Oh, my God. And like I say, Purdy was doing all he could do, but they were picking up on his schemes. He was feeling very pressured. He could not focus, and it showed. Yeah. I'm not saying Lamar Jackson had that great of a game either. It wasn't bad. But he picked it up in the second half. 252 through the air, two touchdowns through the air, uh, 45 yards on the ground, no touchdowns. It's not bad. He's now, I would have to say, the front runner for MVP, maybe. Probably. With him and Tyreek Hill. And, I mean, according to Vegas, he is. Well, yeah, you have to think him, Tyreek Hill, and Christian McCaffrey. McCaffrey did all he could in this game, but by this at this stage, it was too far gone. Can I just say how satisfying it was to see the score of this game? 
Because I know a couple of San Francisco 49ers fans, and it's not I'm not going to paint this brush and say all 49ers mm-hmm. fans are this way, but I know a couple of 49ers fans that are have been fucking obnoxious the last couple yep. weeks, especially when I went to New York City on a bus trip a couple weeks ago, and I had the unfortunate pleasure of sitting in front of them for the 49ers-Eagles game. And I, like, I didn't have a rooting interest in that game I, I, either way with for San Francisco or Philly, mm-hmm. but I had to sit there for you know New York City to where we live is like a three-hour bus ride. Yeah. Four, because we were in the middle of New York City, or about three and a half. Uh, regardless, I had to sit there and listen to them cheer and scream for every single play that went the 49ers way, and then li- listen to them gush and rave about how great Brock Purdy is and how great Christian McCaffrey is, and they're the greatest tandem in the NFL and this and that. And I'm just like, this is fucking obnoxious. So got to admit, this was nice to see. Oh, absolutely. Come back down to earth moment. Mm-hmm. I have to fully agree. So let's get in our teams and then take us out of here, Pat. Yeah, so we'll start with mine because uh, this one was the fucking surprise of all surprises. Uh, on the late game on Christmas Eve, you had the New England Patriots defeat the Denver Broncos 26-23. to Let's ride. Uh, yeah, let's ride onto Somewhere. the... Somewhere? Let's ride onto the bench because uh, as we currently record, Russell Wilson has been benched for the final two remaining games of the regular season. Gutty win for the Patriots. Yeah. They did not quit. I mean, Belichick, if he's going to be there next season or not. Belichick and that hot mic. Yep. Holy crap. Yeah, he was ready to go. So, like I said, good win for the Patriots, uh, especially with the primetime eyes watching. Yeah. Bad loss for the Broncos. Shout out to the Maryland Terrapin, Chad Ryland. Yes. Missed one early. Got one, a crucial one late. Listen, it don't matter about the missed one. You got the you got the clutch one. Everybody just remembers the one you win with. Exactly. Uh, and then we obviously got to talk about your team because the Buffalo Bills on uh, Saturday defeated the, the San Diego Chart San Diego, the Los Angeles Chargers, twenty four to twenty two. Ugly game. Yeah, I'll say. Absolutely ugly game. I'm not even going to lie about it. But the Bills held on when they needed to. Who the fuck is Easton Stick? Oh, exactly. <laughs> The Chargers are just the most inconsistent team in football for a reason. 2019 fifth rounder out of North Dakota State. Okay. And, and then, like I say, the fact that the Bills were even this close with 14 to 10 at halftime. Yeah, Easton Stick as the quarterback of the Chargers. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, why? Just no. North Dakota State legend. Yeah, that's Easton Stick. He played out of his mind, but I tell you what, the Josh looked good. I know he had a he had an interception late, which people are making a big deal about. I'm sorry, the stat line I'm more concerned with: five carries, 15 yards, two touchdowns. Stat line I'm concerned about: Stefan Diggs. He ain't doing shit this year, dude. No, he's, he's he's got a thousand yards receiving, but it's fucking dog shit. Well, he's been taken out of the equation, and this is where the Bills needed somebody to step up. I mean, James Cook did mm-hmm. seventy yards, mm-hmm. not bad. Gabe Davis had a great had a great game, four catches, one hundred thirty and one, and Shakir also had a great game with forty five yards. But this is when you take. Diggs out of the equation. Somebody needs to make a play. Nine weeks since Stefan Diggs had a 100-yard uh, receiving game. Mm-hmm. Last 100-yard receiving game was on Sunday, October the 15th, against the New York Giants. Right. But you know what? He's not complaining because they're winning. That's true. And if that's, they weren't. <laughs> uh, if they wound up losing this game, trust me, there would have been some sound bites. I'm not even going to lie about it. Oh, yeah, there yeah, would have yeah. been some sound bites. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they're winning. They're on a hot streak. It's not pretty. Yeah. But they're now in the playoffs 85% chance, if I'm doing the math right, mm. the Patriots and then the Dolphins are coming up. Two big games, two ones they absolutely need to win. As dog shit as the season's been for me, and this isn't anything against you, no, I'm, yeah. I'm, if the Patriots end up sweeping the Bills this season, season's a fucking win. Oh, I, I could imagine. I like. I don't care how bad we finish. Like If we sweep the Buffalo Bills when everyone wrote us off for dead. Uh, that that'll be enough for me. I don't take any offense to it, Pat. You know that. I know because I'm one of the rare, honest Bills fans you're ever going to meet in or out of podcasting, and I will be very honest. Like the fact the Bills have come back to life mm-hmm. is great. I'm hoping they can continue this magic to make a run, but they need to focus on the Patriots and don't worry about the Dolphins next week. Yeah, that's, that, I am very scared about that. That's entirely possible. Because the one thing that the, has been the Bills' MO this entire year is they have a great game, they have a big win, everybody starts annoying Josh, and the Bills are back, punch your Super Bowl tickets, blah, uh-huh. blah, blah. In comes Brett Favre 2.0. And then, yeah, then we have a fall-off. Yeah. We can't afford a fall-off this late. I'm sorry. Yeah. Just, oh, yeah, you're you need, right. You need two solid games. As long as they can punch, they're officially clinched for playoffs. The one against Miami is not going to break them that bad if they right, lose. Right. 
But I think they understand if they can get a home game out of this. If they can pull off a win against the Patriots at that point, it's just you're in, but it's just proceeding. Yeah, so that's that's the whole situation. So the Patriots game should be a must win. I hope they're treating it as that much because I know Belichick is going to scheme up something. Oh, Belichick's going to look to play spoiler because that'll potentially screw over two teams. Oh, yeah. So I know the Patriots are going to show up. Just the Bills have to show out. Yeah. Uh, one more quick insane stat for you before we finish this out. Uh, for the first time in uh, 70 years, both the Browns and Lions have 10-plus wins in the same season. What a time to be alive. Oh, it's crazy. Love this. Folks, let's talk some NFL football. Week 16 recap. How is your team doing? It is up on that hashtag, hashtag pod. We're nearing the end of the regular season. How is your team doing? And are they going to the playoffs or are you going to be watching from home? Let's talk about your teams. I know a lot of fans have been chiming in about theirs. Definitely like having that conversation going on the social media, so let's keep it rolling. But first, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Do not adjust your dial, or well, your phone, your watch, or whatever the heck you're using to listen to the awesome podcast you're currently listening to. I am the Duke of Nerds, Tyler Mack, and I am here to tell you that being a nerd can be a bit overwhelming, especially after 30. Life moves pretty fast in our nerd culture, and if you don't take the time to notice things, you miss out. That's why I'm here. As your Duke of Nerds, I am charged with educating and enlightening and entertaining you on all things nerdy. I do it by running the 30 and Nerdy podcast. 30 and Nerdy is a bad cast company production and currently playing wherever you cast your pod. Follow along each episode using the hashtag 30 and Nerdy Pod check out what all is going on at 30andnerdypodcast.com whether it's DC, Marvel, comics or video games, I have got you covered. So tune in now. Cheers to you nerds. Coming back for another segment on this year-end edition of the ODPH podcast. And entertainment-wise, it's a little quiet. Everyone went home for the holidays. Mm -hmm. So there's not a lot going on. We're going to be recapping What If next week. Yep. And we're going to kind of put it up to everybody if you want us to talk Rebel Moon. (laughs) I mean, listen, everyone, if you listen to this show long enough, knows my opinion on everything Snyder. Um, I'll be honest, with the reception this movie is getting, you know, I'm, I'm... Tempted to watch it just to see if it's as bad as everyone says it is. I might have to put this up on a Patreon poll, and then maybe we'll take it to Twitter slash X yeah. to see if, if majority votes. Would you do it? Because uh, I'll pull it up. I know on uh, well, no, I, I know on uh, Letterboxd uh, with like fifty five because we were talking about this earlier uh, with fifty five thousand members on Letterboxd having uh, seen the movie. It's currently got like a two point one out of five. Uh, and I'm pulling up the Rotten Tomatoes score right now. Uh, let's see. Rebel Moon Part 1, A Child of Fire, 2023. Uh, critics score is 25%. That's with 142 reviews. And then the audience score is 63%. Hmm. So like I say, we're going to put that poll up. But if, if they do decide to, you need to watch it, will you watch it? I'll, I'll, I mean, I might. I might. Uh, all right. We'll, we'll hit us I, up. I can be swayed by the... Uh, final outcome of the vote yeah hit us up on that hashtag and make sure you, to let our voice know no i'll make this for i'll, I'll tell you this right now we end up watching it. i am not holding back oh i'm not I'm, I'm not expecting you to we have no allegiance with anybody about this one but we do have an allegiance about what we're going to talk about because there is a big event going on nerd initiative mm-hmm. shout out to everybody over there and this is one that if you're a longtime listener to the odph you do know about it's something that i do every year with our good friend, family of the show, Mr. Brian Wayne from Cheers to Comics. Uh, we always do the annual Cheersies Awards. Mm-hmm. And this year's a little different because Brian is uh, not going to be involved in this year's events. He's got a lot of things going on in his Busy neck- dude. Yeah, he's got a lot of things going on in his neck of the woods. So definitely shout out to Brian. And he gave the blessing about taking this to the Nerd Initiative team. And obviously the bullpen is doing some amazing things uh, over there. And we're going to run with the award ceremony live on Nerd Initiative social media's uh, streaming accounts. ODPH is going to be playing them. Hops Geeks News is going to be playing them as well. Nice. So it's going to be everywhere January 2nd, Tuesday night, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, honoring the best of the best in comics. Voting was out of this world this year. Mm-hmm. R- smashed last year's records because every year it's gone up, and every year we've had more creators get involved, which is amazing. And the biggest thing is it's fans voted. Right. It's not my pick. It's not Brian's pick. 
It's always been what the fans want, and it's and it's not like you know you 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 and, and Brian can obviously vote, but it's not like you know some award shows where you know the judging or the, the yeah the judges like have a percentage and factors into it, and oh if if it's more if the percentage is more than what the audience is, well then the judges no no it's all all equal, mm-hmm. and that's a great thing about it because there's so much going on in the world of comics, yeah that yeah. we definitely wanted to give the fans the opportunity to make their voice heard, and boy, did you ever. Oh, yeah. And we're going to have a very, very fun show on January 2nd. But in the meantime, though, we always do a little preview edition here on the ODPH. We get Pad's picks Mm -hmm. for this because he will not be in attendance for the show. So we're going to go through each of the nominees, give you something to kind of talk about on social media, who you think is going to be walking away with those cheersies. Hit us up on that hashtag, uh, ODPH pod, and hashtag NI cheersies. So definitely let us know who you think is walking away with the ballot. And But, Pat, let's get off and uh, start talking about the nominees. Yeah, so the uh, first category we're going to talk about is the best letterer category. Uh, and your nominees are uh, working on Grimm, Tom uh, Napol- Napolitano. Napolitano, working on Nightwing, Wes Abbott, from Batman Superman, Clayton Cowles, from Ghost Rider, Travis Lanham, from Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, Ed Dukeshear, from Inferno Girl Red, it's Becca Carey, from beneath the trees where nobody sees, it's Hassan uh, Atsamain El Hau. From Barnstormers and World Design, Kill Your Darlings, it's J. J- or John J. J. Hill. Almost a like John Hill there. Apologies. From uh, Geiger Ground Zero, it's Rob Lee. And from Blue Beetle, it is Lucas Gattoni. Amazing lineup. That is that is a list of heavy hitters there. And plus, there's one thing, too, with the letters. It's always the forgotten art. Yes. Of comics. Yes. So it's great to see them get acknowledged. I've seen a lot of letters really you know, sing the praises and say thank you on social media, yeah. which, I mean, no, it's like thank you because yeah. a lot of the work goes very just, you know, unsung. Oh, yeah. A lot of people look at the writer. They look at who the artist is, and then they kind of stop there. But letter is definitely an unsung hero. You got a vote on this one, Pad? Uh, listen, there's a lot of great Books in this category, uh, obviously Batman, Superman, big fan of that. Ghost Rider is pretty damn good. Can't go wrong with Money Morphin Power Rangers. Sh- uh, shout out the Inferno Girl Red Team. Yeah, I love the, that book. My personal pick, though, because this book has been hitting on all cylinders, with the exception of uh, one one specific run. Uh, that'd be uh, Wes Abbott and Nightwing. Mm-hmm. Because let, let's face it, if you've run, if you've read the Nightwing series from when they did the dc what was it rebirth yeah you know in 2016 up through currently the only real mess for me and, and i know you agree was the rick grayson time yeah period. you know a lot of potential but not as well executed but regardless it has been flawless from top to bottom with the exception of the rick grayson run so uh i'm gonna say nightwing excellent choice uh next up is the best colorist category and the nominees are rico renzi from grim Igor Monti from Inferno Girl Red, Natalia Marquez from Rogue Sun, Matt Wilson from Click Click Boom, Walter uh, Biamonti from Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, Sarah Antolini from Arcade Kings, Brad Anderson from Geiger Ground Zero, Jody uh, Belair from Birds of Prey, Tamara Bonvillain from B- Batman Superman, and Lee L- uh, Luride, Lou Ridge, excuse me, from Gone. Amazing lineup here. Yeah. Because especially colorists, uh, like we say, much with letters, are always kind of forgotten about. Yeah. And this has been a, a stellar lineup, too, plus all the write-ins we got, too. Mm-hmm. Like, it's been insane as well. But to really see, this has been some of the best artwork you're going to see in comics, and just really, especially in the day and age now. Yeah. They really add so much more to a, a book and a simple panel that just will absolutely blow you away. hmm So, Pat, that being said? I'm going to say Walter uh, Biamonte. Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. I don't always read this one, but like when I catch an issue, or even when I see like, because you get those suggested posts on your Facebook newsfeed. Mm-hmm. Whenever something crazy happens in the Power Rangers universe, or they're getting ready to start something crazy, you'll I'll see the art from that, and it always pops out to me. It always catches my like. It, normally, I'll see a headline and, I, and I'll read the headline before I look at the photo. Probably seven out of ten times when it's it comes to like a suggested post from the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers comics, I'm looking at the art before the headline, just because the color of that and just the way it looks always pops out to me. Mm. No, I mean I I that's a great pick, especially Power Rangers, especially uh, out this week too, the latest edition with the Darkest Hour, yeah, going on right now. So amazing work always happening. Shout out to everybody at Boom Studios 
Fantastic stuff there. Uh, next up is the best illustrator slash artist category, and the nominees are Dan Mora for his work on Batman uh, and slash Superman, Christian Ward for their work on Batman City of Madness, Tyrell Cannon for The Schlub, uh, Geraldo Bor- Geraldo Borges for No Slash One, uh, Chris Samney for Firepower, Daniel Warren Johnson for Transformers, Lorenzo De Felici for Void Rivals, Flaviano for Grimm, Jamal Campbell for Superman, Marco Renna for Rogue Son, uh, French uh, Colomango Car- for Dead the Dead Lucky, Erica DeRusso for Inferno Go Red, Jacques for Gone, and Gary Frank for Geiger Ground Zero. <sighs> Amazing lineup. Uh huh. Amazing. And like the thing is, we we had to put a cap on. Right. Because with the nominations this year, and and this is all based off to the feedback we get for reviews, uh, messages we get to the Nerd Initiative, ODPH, and especially the bullpen all just kind of coming up together. Like this has been like a a who's who of Mm -hmm. who's doing work. And and there's so many other great artists that got written in too as well. Right. Like, this is just an insane lineup, and especially with the work that's being done, and especially a lot of the indie books, too. Yeah. You can definitely tell have made their influence here as yeah. well. So, Pat, that being said, I mean, who are you taking? I'm going to say Jamal Campbell for Superman. Just everything with the Superman line, you know, the last year or so has been, not, as a Superman fan, like, don't get me wrong, I love Star Wars, I love a whole bunch of every comic I read, but Superman has been my guy since, like, the late 90s. Mm-hmm. I love everything about the Superman comic these days. Yeah, the one with him and Joshua Williamson on is uh-huh. been absolutely lights out. Uh-huh. Absolutely. And that's saying something, too, because the entire Superman line is on point right now. Uh, you want to talk a heavy hitter? This next category is <sighs> Chalk Full of Them. Uh, this is the best writer category, and the nominees are Scott Snyder for Book of Evil, or Book of Evil, excuse me, Stephanie Phillips for Grimm, David Pepos for The Devil That Wears My Face, James Tynan for Something Is Killing the Children, Tom Taylor for Nightwing, Kelly Thompson for Black uh, Cloak, Melissa Flores for The Dead Lucky slash Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, Joshua Williamson for Superman, Kyle Higgins for Radiant Black, Ryan Parrott for Rogue Son, Brian Busoletto for Midlife, Matt Groom for Inferno Girl Red, Alan Dunford and Will Radford for Grandma Chainsaw, Jeff Johns for Geiger Ground Zero, Daniel Warren Johnson for Transformers, and Robert Kirkman for Void Rivals. Talk about an insane lineup. Half of these people we know and are friends with, and I'm going to piss somebody off with my, my pick here. Oh, I know. This, this is the thing, too. I was, yeah. I, was getting, I was getting message left and right. Oh. They're like, how many times can I vote? I'm like, listen, it's unlimited because we like to do it old school TRL style. Oh, yeah. If you want to vote, vote. You know, if you feel that passionate about it, vote as much as you want. Like, I don't think that it damages any integrity of no. a vote. That's just my opinion on that. But, yeah, this one, I mean, we have been fortunate enough to have a good majority yeah. of this list on the show. Scott Snyder, Stephanie Phillips, yeah, no. The, the Massiverse team. Massiverse team, yeah. You know, Alan Dunford has yep. been on multiple times. Alan's due back very, very soon in the new year. Yeah. Like I say, we – and uh, there's a couple of names on this list that are scheduled to come to the mm. ODPH, but we, we have not <laughs> finalized that yet. But that's the whole problem. It's like right now it's like – it's such a great time to be picking up comics and you're seeing, uh, you know, so many surprises in there too. Yeah. Uh, Cause like I say, the indie movement is a big deal right now. So yeah. it's, it's amazing to see. Yeah. Pad. This is no offense to any of friends of the show, but my, my pick for this is I didn't start this series when it started. I picked it up once I picked up DC infinite, you know, this, this year. And once I hit this writer's run, for this comic, I binged through this faster than anything I've read ever. That's saying something. Uh-huh. And it's Tom Taylor Nightwing. The Tom Taylor Nightwing run has been top to bottom incredible. Mm-hmm. I cannot think of one thing in there where I'm like, ah, you know what? I didn't really enjoy that. Yeah. You know, th- that wasn't really a, a hit for me. This, it was, you know, it was a swing and a miss or a foul ball. Everything about his run, even this year, has been chef's kiss. Oh, yeah. I mean, Tom Taylor is doing such a fantastic work. Even the stuff he's doing now with Beast World. Yeah. And, I mean, to be in charge of the company crossover and how insane that story has been. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's a fantastic pick. Like I say, you can't go wrong with no. anybody here. Like, anybody that makes the nominations, you know you've done something right. Uh-huh. Uh, next up is the Best Editor category, and the nominees are uh, Michael 
Basiddle for all Massive Verse titles, uh, Black Market Narrative slash Image Comics. Will Dennis for Book of Evil, Buy a Thread, uh, Best Jacket Press. Heather Antos for Star Trek IDW Publishing. Tom Brevort for Moon Knight uh, at Marvel. Ben Abernathy for Batman and Green Arrow uh, in for DC Comics. Andrew uh, Marino for Blue Beetle from DC Comics. Amanda LaFranco for Firepower from Skybound Entertainment slash Image Comics. Jordan D. White for Ms. Marvel, The New Mutant from Marvel. R- uh, Ramiro Portnoy and Eric Harb- Harburn for C- uh, S- Something Sick- is Killing the Children. Something is Killing the Children uh, from Boom Studios. Tom Groneman for Spider-Man Miles Morales. Mark uh, Penchia for Obi-Wan Kenobi, Marvel. Chris Rosa for Flash D- uh, from DC Comics. Sean McKaywitz and John Jonathan Manning for Transformers from Skybound slash Image. Bixie Mat- Mathieu uh, from Void Rivals from Skybound slash Image. Brian Cunningham from uh, for Geiger Ground Zero from Ghost Machine slash Image. And Nick Lowe for Amazing Spider-Man uh, at, and Marvel. This is the funniest story about the Cheersies this year. Uh-huh. And it's nothing uh, about anybody who's nominated, because obviously they do fantastic work. The whole concept of best editor right. spiraled out of the Radiant Black Discord. Okay. Because uh, I, th- I think it was Matt Groom. Shout out to Matt, obviously, friend of the show. Yep. Posted in there everybody's nominations, and it was you know so excited to see Inferno Girl Red got nominated, Dead Lucky, Rogue Sun, yeah. Radiant Black. Yeah. And Michael Basiddle, who is a friend of the show too, was like, oh, no best editor award. Hmm. <laughs> I see how it is. Something in that variation. And the response from that Discord was like, how do you guys not have a best editor? Now, I will be very honest. We have never had a best editor in the previous four years of the comic or the, the awards. Right. It just it never came up in discussion, I guess. Like, it's just with Brian and I talking about this. And is one that obviously the editors play such a, a crucial role in everything. Oh, yeah. You know, from presentation to making sure continuum is filled. You know, so mm-hmm, much is going mm-hmm. on. That, yeah, I mean, we felt it was definitely worthy of it. And when we threw out, like, who, you know, who would make nominations, like the entire Nerd Initiative bullpen shouted out names. And that's the list you get here, too. Yeah. And it's ones that we had some fans obviously feel very passionate about. I mean, the Massiverse has always got a, a rabid fan base. So you yeah, knew, they do. You knew Michael was going to get nominated. And just to see this, we're doing this, and the reaction we've gotten from the editors, too, has been very cool. So, yeah. Pad, that being said. I'm going to give it to Nick Lowe, Amazing Spider-Man Marvel, just because, listen, all, all of these editors are wonderful people, and they do incredible work mm-hmm. from top to bottom. But you think of what has gone on in the Amazing Spider-Man line the, just in the last year, and juggling that, and everything they've come up with, and keeping it straight, and just all the behind the scenes and stuff that's been public, you know, in terms of just like the reaction and, and the blowback and everything else. Amazing job by him. Cause that's having to juggle a lot and deal with a lot of stuff going on. And it's still, at least on some level, been enjoyable. I didn't hate, listen, if for as not great as it's been, I didn't hate it. Like I hated reading the Rick Grayson stuff. I was not a fan of the Rick Grayson stuff, but even the Spider-Man stuff, I still enjoyed it on some level. No, that's fair. I mean, we have not gotten into it. I, I think everybody that knows me well knows my opinions of two certain issues yeah. of this current run. And, yeah. like, listen, I'm a fan. I'm allowed to have that take. Yeah. But I will say this. I think the stuff they're doing now with Gang War yeah. has been a vast improvement. Oh, yeah. And I think that trying to keep track of a big crossover like that, yeah, you have to give a tip of that to the editors. And, it's, and especially just with the stuff that happened just this year yeah, and the blowback, they could have easily done a 180 and said, you know what? We were looking to push the envelope. We might have pushed a little too far. Let's dial it back a little sure. bit. Let's tell. Let's do a ninety degree turn. Go a different direction. They stuck to. They stuck to their beliefs and what they wanted to do, and they kept going. Well, you have to. You know, I think if you're doing any kind of book, like and especially a high profile one like Spider Man, right? You know, there's a dedicated fan base. Yeah, pop culture is involved. Oh yeah, the most popular character Marvel has. Uh, yeah, arguably. I mean, I I, I think I would say yes. Um, yeah, I mean, we, that's a great, con- the great argument too. Cause yeah. now with the MCU, right. I know Deadpool's in that conversation now, yeah. you know, like I say, there's, yeah. a, but I was, I agree with you. I think Spider-Man takes it, yeah. you know, is easy number one, but with all that being said, yeah, I mean, if you're going to take a, a controversial idea and run with it for a story mm-hmm. and especially with the blowback that came from fans. Yeah. I mean, you got to stick to your guns about it and they did. 
And yeah. I think it's a testament to the editorial team that they were like, listen, this is a great story. We're going to go with it. And they then they felt that passion about it. Boom. They stuck with it. So yeah. kudos to them about that. Uh, next up is the best publisher category. And the nominees are Marvel Entertainment, DC Comics, Boom Studios, Image Comics, IDW Publishing, Dark Horse Comics, Mad Cave Studios, Dynamite Entertainment, AWA Studios, Scout Comics, uh, Distillery, and Comicsology Originals. Man, great lineup right there. Uh huh. And, and and that's to say, like we had a, a couple great write-ins too. Yeah. Like I say, I'm not reading off everybody the write-ins we got because I mean we we'd be here all night. Yeah. But do you think about the work that's been done, and especially from the indies too? Because I mean, a lot of times when you talk to pop culture fans, it's only Marvel and DC. Right. And it's like you don't realize about the other stuff that's going There's on. There's a lot going. There's amazing stuff happening in comics right now. It's it's such a, a wonderful time to be a fan. Mm-hmm. And no matter where you turn, like I say, a couple upstart companies came yeah. in there too. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, made some noise this year. So, Pat, who are you giving yours to? I'm gonna give it to Marvel Entertainment. Okay. Just just because you know you've got the Ultimate Invasion going on or the stuff with the Ultimate Universe coming back. That's absolutely nuts. The, everything they've done with uh, the X Men, crazy Star Wars. Not freaking sad, mm-hmm. you know. But that Invincible Iron Man line, oh my god, I that was been insane to read. You know, it's just I just think of like the number of stuff I've got on my following list on on Marvel Unlimited. Mm-hmm. It, it's real long, and there there are some weeks where I'm like, oh god, I got a lot to read this week. Yeah, uh, so I, I'm gonna give it to Marvel. No, no argument there. Uh, next up is the best is best indie series, and the nominees are uh, Something Is Killing the Children from Boom Studios, Local Man from Image Comics. Grandma Chainsaw from Rabbit in the Hat Studios, Grimm from Boom Studios, Black Cloak from Image Comics, The Alternates from Dark Horse Comics, Midlife from Image Comics, No Slash One from Image Comics, Radiant Black from Image Comics, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers from Boom Studios, Void Rivals from Image Comics, The Hunger and the Dusk from IDW Publishing, Damn Them All from Boom Studios, and Rogue Sun from Image Comics. Crazy lineup of books right there. Yep, yep, yep. But you know the indies are killing it right now. Like I say, no one has been amazing. Um, Radiant Black is always uh, something to, special to read, especially right now what they're doing the Catalyst War. Yeah, the Hunger and the Dusk is a story too that more people, in my opinion, need to go check out. It's fantastic, and it's something Pat. It would be up your alley. Okay, knowing you. Okay, that would be something. Seeing Grandma Chainsaw though too, especially uh, yeah. Alan and the team getting in there. Like I say, they're the I I have to ask Alan next time we talk to him. Like, what is the official name of their fan base? Okay, you know, is it the Pocus Platoon or is it <laughs> is something like that? They showed out in force and really were making their voice heard for the voting too. Like I say, it's it's always cool just to see the fans come out and just really start voicing their opinions about their books and feeling that passion about it. Like this is something about being fans, especially when they're not being toxic. Yeah, like they're just excited to see like, yeah. oh my god, we made the ballot. Like, what is this? Ah, yeah. So. That being said, Pat, I mean, who are you taking? I'm going to say Radiant Black. Listen, I've, I've loved a bunch of these. They're all good, but Radiant Black has just stood out for me. That, like, just when I thought it couldn't get better, or like they might have plateaued a little bit, they raised the bar that much higher. Nah, fair enough. Uh, next up is Best Marvel Series, and the nominees for this are Darth Vader, Black, White, and Red, Carnage, Captain Marvel, Daredevil, Ghost Rider, X-Force, Wolverine, Invincible Iron Man, Uncanny Avengers and Fantastic Four. Marvel had a monster year. Oh my god, yeah, they did. Yeah, they they really do. They got so much stuff going on for 2024. Like, it's scary to think. Like, in my opinion, right now, just seeing like what they have coming out. Uh huh. They're gonna top it. Oh yeah. It's just with the return of the Ultimates, the end of the Cohen era, uh, Blood Hunt. That's the big crossover that you know that was making some noise for coming on New York Comic Con this year. They have got a lot of things in the works. Yeah, they do. But this year was a monster year for them as well. I mean, Pad, who are you taking? I'm going to say Invincible Iron Man just okay. because I've never been that big of an Iron Man comic guy. Mm-hmm. But once I picked up Marvel Unlimited and I and I saw that the new issue came out, and it was relatively close to when they started dropping on Marvel Unlimited. I was like, you know, I'll go, I'll go give this a read. Binge through it as fast as I could. Yeah. It, it's an incredible run that... I highly recommend everybody read just because what they're doing and kind of this way, the the path they're taking with it. Well, boy, is there some implications? Mm-hmm. No, I definitely agree. I think that's been one of the standout titles this year. Yeah. Uh, next up is best DC series. And the nominees are blue beetle, Batman slash Superman world's finest, the flash birds of prey, Superman, 
Nightwing, Wonder Woman, Titans, Gotham Year One, and Batman. I will say this. With the dawn of DC that's happening right now, uh huh. It's been such a res- resurgence uh-huh. of reminding you about like why you care about these heroes and, yeah. and what the, what impact they do and you know like all this amazing stuff. Yeah, it's made me become more of a DC fan. Uh huh. And I've been fortunate enough; I've been able to review a lot of the stuff this year. Yeah. And there's so many books that like say we had to put the cap on the list, but even one that I think more people need to be talking about, and that's Alan Scott, the Green Lantern. Yes. That series has been absolutely lights Holy out. Holy cow! One of my favorites right now, and just to see like. The resurgence of superheroes getting back to superheroes. Uh huh. It's just been awesome to see with DC. Like I say, they've been doing a great run this year. I mean, this is this is one of the most highly contested ballots yeah. of the year. I mean, Pat, who are you giving your cheersy to? I'm going to give it to Superman. Listen, I, I love Nightwing, and they've been top to bottom incredible, but just Superman has just raised that bar all that higher for a character that's been around for like 80 plus years, you know, raising the bar when I didn't know if it was quite possible. It's yeah. insane. No, I have to. I mean, like I say, that's up there for me. Like, I'm not revealing who I voted for. Sure. Um, just because I want to keep some a little bit of integrity here. Sure. Because uh, I'll be talking about it on the show, on the actual awards show. But mm-hmm. Superman has been awesome, and especially too, like if, if if I can't stress enough, if anybody hasn't been checking out the Superman line, yeah, yeah, do it. They absolutely needed to go do it. Especially like I know they're making a little transition with Action Comics. Yep. We'll talk about that in the picks this week, but. It's a great time to be a Superman fan. Uh, next up is Best Debut Issue, and the nominees are Batman City of Madness from DC Comics, Buy a Thread from Comicsology Originals, The Devil's Cut from Distillery, Void Rivals from Image Comics, Nice Jewish Boys from Comicsology Originals, The Schlub from Image Comics, The Punisher from Marvel Comics, Transformers from Image Comics, No One from uh, Image Comics, Gone from Distillery, Black Sight from Comixology Originals, Cap Wolf and the Howling Commandos from Marvel, Superman from DC Comics, and Geiger Ground Zero from Image Comics slash, slash Ghost Machine. Stellar lineup of brand new series this year. Yeah. Like you say, even if it's a, a limited series, it, it stands out. And just to see just the variety here. Yeah. Like that's the thing that stuck out to me. Like just amazing stuff all around. You can't go wrong no matter who made the list here. No. But, Pat, who are you taking? Superman. I mean, listen, I love Superman. I, You know, it's been – I've kind of fallen – I'd fallen off him a little bit, mm-hmm. you know, the last couple of years just because it, it wasn't really clicking for me. I just – I saw they were, you know, renumbering, restarting, whatever you want to – phrase you want to use for it, and I'm like, you know, why don't I give this a shot? And I, I've been on the train ever since. It's, it's incredible to read. All right. Fair enough. Uh, next up is Event of the Year, and the nominees for this are Distillery Debuts at San Diego Comic-Con, Ghost Machine Debut at New York Comic-Con, Dawn of DC Kicks Off a New Era, The Energon Universe, uh, that being G.I. Joe and Transformers, debuts via Skybound, Supermassive 2023, Night Terrors from DC Comics, Greg Capullo Returns to Marvel, Death and Rebirth of Miss Marvel, and Catalyst War from Radiant Black. So I want to give a little clarification for this, too. Okay. So when we talked about event, some immediately thought, like, oh, it has to be, like, an actual event. Right. You know, like San Diego Comic-Con. Sure. New York. Sure. And then some other fans were saying, no, it, it should be, like, a story. Sure. And I said, really, what is the difference? Yeah, I mean, about the same. I mean, they're about the same, just when yeah. one's physical, one's not. Yeah. But there's still moments of the year that you remember as a fan that stand out. Yeah. That you're like, oh, I remember either picking up this issue or I remember going to this con and seeing this happen. Yeah. And that's where we kind of went with this. Yeah. So it's been something that I I love seeing the turnout. I love seeing the write-ins, too, because a lot of fans were writing about different stuff that was happening at conventions. Yeah. Different moments throughout the year. Like, it's it's been some really cool stuff to see that, in, that interaction with fans. Yeah. So... Definitely exciting con, uh, concept that we did for this year's uh, event. Yeah. But Pad, I want to know what's your pick for event of the year. So just to talk about a couple of these, Dawn of DC, obviously I love mm-hmm. because that's got just what they've been doing since they did started Dawn of DC has got me reading more DC books than I have in quite some time. Mm-hmm. Um, then you got Night Terrors. Absolutely nuts. Some of the stuff they've done with that. Um, but I got to give it to Death and Rebirth of Miss Marvel just because when I read that that was happening, that was right before the Marvel's movie was getting ready to come out. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the TV show had obviously come out, you know, with, with Miss Marvel. 
And obviously, when you look at the history of Marvel Comics, you know, the last number of years, when they're getting ready to come out with one of their movies, you know, and, and, and they got the property, they will do a big ramp up or a reboot or what have you of that of that character. Mm-hmm. And the fact that like we were like a what, like a month or two away from the movie coming out and they decided they were going to kill off Miss Marvel. I went, what? Yeah. That like they're doing what now? They're killing like and obviously they brought we knew they were gonna bring her back and some changes were gonna happen. And and obviously it did, but just the sheer fact that like they decided to go and kill her off in a very controversial way. You know, a lot of people had a lot of opinions about it. Definitely the moment for me that I, I sat back and went, Whoa. And you know the really cool thing too is Amon Volani is now writing That's also Marvel awesome. too. Yeah. Like it's it's insane. Yeah. One more award, though, Pad, and this is the big one. Uh huh. Comic of the year. Uh, the nominees for this are The Devil's Cut from Distillery, Predator vs. Wolverine issue number two from Marvel, Supermassive 2023, X Men Hellfire Gala 2023 from Marvel, Swan Song number two, Nightwing number 105 from DC Comics, Radiant Black number 24 from Image Comics. Superman, The Last Days of Lex Luthor, issue number one from DC Comics. Something is Killing the Children, issue number 34 from Boom Studios. Uh, Transformers, issue number one from Image Comics slash Skybound. And Geiger, Ground Zero, issue number one from Image Comics slash Ghost Machine. (sighs) Talk about a year in comics. Uh Uh-huh. Like I say, this was a monster year. Yep. And there was a couple books, too. That did get a massive write in. Oh. I'll even plug one was uh, Beneath the Trees Where Nobody Sees from okay. IDW. Okay. That one got a monster push late um, for the ballots. And if, right. you have, if you haven't checked that out, that is a wild story. Uh huh. Absolutely crazy thing. It's, it's fantastic series. Uh, but yeah, this one, I mean, one of the most highly contested ballots of the year. Right. Really came down to the final couple days. I'm going to give a little peek behind the curtain. Okay. So it did come out from behind the curtain. And when the dust was settled, um, which you'll find out when you watch the award show, you, you'll definitely know. Like, it, it, I mean, we'll be, we'll be raving about it. So right. I definitely have a lot to say about that. Then right. I know I'm rambling because I'm stalling because I'm just like, I don't want to give anything away. Right. Because I, I honestly, all these books that were nominated do, are, are, all books you should have in your collection. Period. Right, right. But there can only be one winner. Yeah. Technically. Technically. Speaking. They're, so. all, they're all winners in our books. Yes. Uh, I'm going to give it to Nightwing issue number 105. Just okay. because that one was absolutely nuts to read. You know, when I was going through it this year, re- reading it. Mm-hmm. Because the whole thing is from, the, the whole issue is from the first person perspective of Dick. Mm-hmm. You know, it's from Night, you see everything, which... You read it, and it's and it's you read up to the, you know the fir- the previous hundred and four issues, and it's fairly standard like third person, you know, a little bit of you're you're seeing his thoughts and what he's thinking or whatever else. But then to just flip the script and decide, you know what, we're going to do a whole issue from literally his first person view. Yeah, risky to say the least. You know, you don't know how it's going to play out, but for me, it worked beautifully. It's, that was a hell of an issue. It was, but like I say, it just it, it's a testament to what they're doing over at DC. Yeah. And especially Tom Taylor and the whole team there. Yeah. So that is Pad's picks for the Cheersies. But you definitely want to see what everybody else has voted on for the best of the best 2023. And once again, that is going to be taking place Tuesday night, January 2nd, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Nerd Initiative streaming YouTube, social media accounts. You're going to see it on ODPH. You're going to see it on Hops Geeks News, uh, amongst other places. It's going to be a big event, so if you're into comics and you want to see it, uh, there are a couple surprises I know that are going to happen um, to give a little incentive, uh, but uh, you'll definitely have to watch and tune in and just be a fan and celebrate the best of the best in comics that night. So that being said, hit us up on the hashtag. Let us know your picks going into the Cheersies event. Definitely curious what everybody uh, is kind of leaning, what they think is who's who they think is going to win. Uh, definitely an exciting time to be a comic fan. So we'll definitely let's chat about it. In the meantime, and always make sure that you're dropping that like, follow, and subscribe to NerdInitiative.com and on the YouTube channel as well. Because, like I say, that's got a lot of big things happening in 2024. So that all being said, we're going to take one final break. We'll be right back. Hey, this is Scott Snyder, and you better. Listen to the ODPH podcast or I'm coming for you and Batman is coming for you. 
Coming back for the final segment on this year-end edition of the ODPH Podcast. Pad, what do you got? Got a couple things to talk about. Uh, first of which is obviously the local minute and looking at the standings for the Federal Prospects Hockey League. That is, of course, the league our local Binghamton Black Bears playing. Another week, still in first place in the Empire Division for Let's our Binghamton go. Black Bears. Uh, so, through 21 games played, they have a record of 15 wins, two losses in overtime, uh, and then three losses in either overtime or shootout. They have a grand total of uh, 50 points. Uh, Motor City behind them with 34 points. Danbury in third with 29 points. Uh, Watertown in fourth with 18 points. Then Elmira in fifth place with 16 points. Uh, Looking at the schedule they had this past week, had a couple of games. Uh, Friday, December 22nd, they uh, were at home against the Watertown Wolves where they picked up the win by the final score of 5-2. to two. Uh, And then if you went on Saturday, if you hate defense, boy, was that the game for you <laughs> because the Binghamton Black Bears won by the final score of 9-1. to one. Yeah, defense optional. Yeah, I was uh, going to say. The, for the upcoming week, the Binghamton Black Bears are on the road this weekend. Uh, well, well, two out of the three games are on the road. Uh, Friday, December 29th, 7 o'clock, 7.05 p.m. Eastern, they are on the road playing the Elmira River Sharks. So then Saturday, December 30th, at 7 o'clock Eastern, they are on the road playing the Danbury Hat Tricks. However, Sunday, December 31st, at 5 o'clock Eastern, uh, they are at home playing the Danbury Hat Tricks. So they definitely go down to the game. You get out enough in time for some uh, New Year's Eve festivities. Uh, if you're looking to do that, more tickets, information, all that good stuff. BinghamtonBlackBears.com. Yeah, it's a real fun time, especially on New Year's Eve. That's a yeah. that's a very old school tradition up uh-huh. here in, in the six oh seven. Uh, then we got to talk a little bit of uh, hockey and specifically Barry Melrose news uh, mm. because John John Buchigross, uh, who of course is most well known for being uh, on Sports Center on ESPN here in the states, uh, tweeted last night as we record, uh, "quote." As we told you a couple months ago, our boy Barry Melrose went public with his Parkinson's disease. Time now to repay his years of hockey service symbolically to him and tangibly to the cause by raising money for Parkinson's research, which is making real strides. Here's a t-shirt to do that. I hope you'll, you like them and you will consider purchasing one. Proceeds from these will all go to Parkinson's charities. Also, hashtag Bucci Overtime Challenge and hashtag College Hockey, uh, spelled like you're Canadian, so it's hashtag Hashtag C-A-W-L-I-D-G-E-H-A-W-K-E-Y. Uh, proceeds will also do the same for at least 2024. Please spread the word. And so if you go to assistmelrose.com, takes you to this wonderful site, which it says uh, gives you the title, Barry's given his life to hockey. Let's do something for him as he battles Parkinson's. Proceeds go to the Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's Research. And there is an awesome shirt. Uh, little, mm-hmm. Got a gray coloring. And then it's got uh, Barry Melrose's trademark hair, trademark beard with a tie. Uh, although, admittedly, that tie is not outlandish enough for what you used to see Barry Melrose on TV. This is true. This is true. And it's got his trademark cigar in his mouth. uh, And for only $29.99, there'll be probably some shipping and handling on the other end of things. You can pick up uh, a shirt. Sizes range from small to triple XL. uh, And definitely want to give that a play. Check out if you're a hockey fan or you grew up watching SportsCenter like me. And I primarily knew Barry Melrose from uh, his ESPN days and the the awesome suits he wore. Yeah, this is a great cause to get behind. And, and, you know, obviously, yeah, if you grew up watching, Mm -hmm. you you know, um, yeah, yeah, you know Barry's impact. And, and uh, if you're interested in buying it, like we said, it, the website is assistmelrose.com. The uh, link will also be in the show notes of this episode. Excellent, Pat. Uh, and then we're going to talk a little bit of NBA news because uh, a little bit of an interesting sale took place and uh, got finalized today as we record. Uh, and that is of the Dallas Mavericks variety. Oh, okay. Uh, so, so reading from an article on ESPN.com, it says, quote, the NBA on, NBA on Wednesday approved the sale of controlling interest of the Dallas Mavericks for from Mark Cuban to the families that run the Las Vegas Sands Casino Company. The deal, Interesting. The deal was approved just shy of a month since the families of Miriam Adelson and uh, Sivan and Patrick Dumont announced their intention to buy the club. The purchase is in the valuation range of $3.5 billion. <sighs> That's insane. Uh, just a little side note. This isn't in the article. I want to point out, Mark Cuban bought that team for like $6 million. Yeah, he bought it for next to nothing. And he just flipped it for $3.5 million. God damn. Uh, the article goes on to say, quote, Patrick Dumont, president and chief operating officer of the Las Vegas Sands Company and Adelson's son-in-law will serve as Mavericks governor. Adelson is the widow of casino magnate Sheldon Adel- Adelson. 
Cuban is expected to maintain control of basketball operations, and there's no indication the club will leave Dallas. Cuban has said he wanted to partner with Las Vegas Sands with long with a long range plan of building an arena in downtown Dallas that will include a hotel and casino. Gambling isn't legal in Texas, and efforts to legalize it face steep odds. Still, Miriam Adelson has made no secret of her push to bring casino gambling to the Lone Star State. She pumped more than $2 million last year into a political action committee called Texas Sands, which donated lavishly to state legislatures and swarmed the GOP-controlled state capital with lobbyists. She gave an additional $1 million separately to Republican Governor Greg Abbott. Close quote. So a little bit of interesting backroom politics aside, because that's a whole other ball of wax I, mm. I haven't even got time to get into. Yeah. Interesting, because uh, Mark Cuban always, you know, well, most well known for being courtside and animated and loud and raucous with uh, the Dallas Mavericks, but he's not exactly going to be controlling interest anymore. Yeah, you know, he must be. I know he's got a million other things going on. Oh he's, yeah, he's, oh yeah. He's a very, very busy. busy Something's got to be going on though, because if also like a week before the the sale announcement came out, he said that either this season that's currently airing or the next one that's coming is going to be his last on Shark Tank. Dude's got something going on. He's got something going on. He's got something planned. I mean, he's definitely put in the work, so Uh I'm definitely going to keep an eye on what he does. I'm a big fan of what he does. Like, I think he's he's somebody that when he took this team over, he made it into something. Talk about, we talked to Dan Campbell about changing the culture. He did that with Dallas. Yeah. He actually made people want to watch Dallas and players come to Dallas. Yeah. So definitely have to respect that. And I've got to mention one more NBA story because, yeah, we, we alluded to it earlier. Oh, my God, yeah. Uh, we got to talk a little bit of Detroit Pistons because Detroit, uh, it's a good thing the Lions are playing good because you ain't got much else going for you. Uh, the Detroit Pistons set an NBA record with their 27th straight loss. Uh, reading from an article on ESPN.com, it says, quote, It's history not many fans inside Little Caesars Arena were looking forward to experiencing Tuesday night, but the Detroit Pistons couldn't avoid NBA infamy, dropping their 27th straight game with a 118-112 loss to the Brooklyn Nets. It's the most consecutive losses in a single season in league history. The 76ers have the overall record, losing 28 straight, but that spanned the 2014-15 and 2015-16 seasons. Detroit hasn't won a game since its home opener on October 28th against Chicago, and and now is 2-28 on the season. Close quote. Yikes. You know, there's a point where you know you're a bad team. Uh huh. It's, it's a lot of red on this schedule. There's a lot of red. Oh, Jesus. But but here's the here's the point. I was having this conversation with Richmond 3 of about this. Sure. There comes a point when you're you're you have to really find a way to win. Mm-hmm. Because the way this comes to me, and granted, this is just my opinion. Uh-huh. Your players have quit. Yep. Your coaching has quit. Yep. Nobody cares. Nope. Because if you are a true competitor, you will find a way, and I'm not saying to cheat to win, but you will win dirty. You will win some way, somehow, if you want to avoid this from happening. Uh Uh-huh. And how I read this is... Call up Isaiah Thomas. Tell him, what, what, bring up the old Detroit Piston days. Well, I'm saying, like, you got to do something to spark your team. Like, you know, like in hockey. Right. You know, when you have to get the team going, what do you do? You know, somebody has a fight. Yeah. Somebody does something to, to spark something. Yeah. I watched this Pistons team play. And, yeah, on paper, they're not bad right. per se. Like, I mean. Right. But they have no heart. No. In my opinion. But their, their spirits are broken. Well, that's the whole thing. You start losing and you you accept the fact that you lose. But the fact that you lost 27 in a row. Uh Uh-huh. With how the NBA, you know, you have games where you can catch a team sleeping. Yeah. Especially how the schedule's written. Yeah. The fact that you let this happen, it just, it it shows you guys quit. Uh Uh-huh. And if if I'm a fan, I take the year off. Yeah. Until, no, until you show me something. And I tell you what, this streak ain't going to end anytime soon because, Ken, I believe you have the NBA standings up. Oh, yes, I do. Uh, so I'm looking at the Detroit Pistons schedule uh, So the next couple of games. They're off tonight as we record. Their next game is Thursday, December 28th in Boston. Uh, Ken, what's Boston's record? 23-6. and six. Uh, I'm looking at the game preview for this game. Currently, Boston is favored by 17.5. I believe it. The over-under is 232.5. 
Yikes. Mm -hmm. Uh, Then after that, they have a game on Saturday, December 30th, against the Toronto Raptors. Toronto Raptors, eh, not doing so hot. They are 11 and 18, so eh, maybe a shot. You never know. Uh, Wine, not out for that game yet. Mm -hmm. And then after that, Monday, January 1st, they are on the road playing the Houston Rockets. So this is very easily, they're not going to beat Boston. There's there's no way. They shouldn't beat Boston. Right. They should not. Let's say there's a 1% chance. There's a shot. Maybe. Toronto. There's a shot. You never know. Houston, eh, less so. Hugh, no, Tor- Toronto, there's a better shot. If they're going to win out of the next three games, it's going to be Toronto. Well, yeah. But this is the question I would have for the Pistons. But uh, honestly, from what I've seen in the past couple of games, I've checked them out. They, yeah. They don't care. No. And you can tell they don't care. Because after that, you got Utah, Golden State, Denver, Sacramento, San Antonio, and Houston. Yeah. And then you got Washington, Minnesota, and then a back-to-back Again, oh, one's on Saturday, one's on Monday, but they're both in Milwaukee. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's not going to get any better. Enough said. Mm-hmm. All we got to say is the Knicks won on Christmas Day. Hey. Impressive win over Milwaukee. Jalen Brunson. Brunson, oh, lights out. He, he, he understands he is the face of the Knicks. He is putting on franchise performances. Yeah. They still need to make a move to get – uh, you know, like I said, Carl Something. Anthony Carl Anthony Towns, I'm trying to will this into existence, him to come to New York. Just just remember what happened the last time you wanted to will something into existence and how that worked. Just, just eh, Well, you know, it went, to, it went to Brooklyn and crashed their franchise. I'm okay with this. That's true. Like I say, so worst to worst, we're going to crash the, the Minnesota Timberwolves. Yeah, could be. I, don't, I mean, I have no ill will for them, but if yeah. it crashes, it crashes. Yeah. Like I say, as long as it doesn't crash the Garden, we're okay because, you know what, the Rangers are still number one in the Metropolitan Division. This is true. 23-8. and eight. Impressive overtime win by Chris Kreider. Should be the captain. Kreider or die. Kreider or die. All day, every day. Yeah, he should be captain. I said it. I'm still not taking that stance away. Uh, so the blue shirts are back in action tonight as we record against the Capitals. So, like I say, and put on a professor, impressive performance, but the Islanders are catching up, though. So that means if you see any tweets from Ken tonight, they will all be in lowercase. <laughs> Because no capitals. Yeah, exactly. Shout love. out to that campaign they did a couple years ago. Love that. Absolutely love that. Well, before we get out of here, it is new comic book day. So, Pad, yes. let's send the re- let's send our audience home on a good note. Uh, so, I've only got two this week. Uh, one from DC Comics, the other from Marvel. The one from DC Comics this week is Action Comics 2023 Annual uh, from Phil K. Johnson. And this one reads, Nora Stone's true form has been revealed. Her gateway between worlds is opened, and the invasion of Earth has begun. As the, multi- as the multiverse's two most powerful families clash above Metropolis, which legacy will Otho Ra choose? Will the followers of Blue Earth defend their treacherous leader or their own home? It has all led to this. Three years of action comic storylines com- culminate in this pivotal, dramatic, double-sized issue. It's a hell of an issue here and a lot of buzz already about this, so uh-huh. this is going to be one definitely keep an eye out for. And then lastly, certainly not leastly, Star Wars Dark Droids issue number five from... Charles Soul. Uh, this one reads, The terrifying conclusion of the biggest Star Wars comic event of the year. The final triumph of the Scourge. How can the Rebellion and the Empire combat such a threat? Unlikely allies join forces to fight the greater evil invading the galaxy. And what is the final fate of warrior droid Ajax Sigma? This is going to be nuts. The dark droid stuff has been very interesting. A little different. Yeah, very different, interesting. Different take on Star Wars than what you're used to, but it's been good. Yeah, no, it's definitely been different, but I like different. Yeah. So I'm not mad about it, but yeah, I do agree with you. Like, this is not your average Star Wars story. They're, they're keeping it different, but they're also keeping it at least plausible for Star Wars. Mm-hmm. Oh, fully agree. Yep. Uh, so my picks this week, and obviously with being a short week because the holiday, I only got a couple. Uh, from DC, I alluded to it earlier, one of the best series out that more people need to be talking about, and that is Alan Scott, The Green Lantern, uh-huh. Tim Sheridan, Sienna Tormi. Uh, they now have uh, a very cool cameo that uh, it's right on the cover, so I'm not spoiling anything. The Spectre makes his appearance in the story. And it's a fantastic read, like I say, top to bottom. Uh, everything the team is doing, Chris Sotomayor, Matt Herms, Lucas Gatoni, everybody is really stepping up for this series. Like It is one uh, fantastic story top to bottom. If you're not picking this up, I highly, highly, highly recommend you go out to the comic shops and go pick it up. On the digital side of things for this issue, but keep an eye out from Dark Horse Comics for the print version, we finally have the conclusion of Canary Hmm. by Scott Snyder and Dan Pinozin. So the horror western ends on a very, very solid note, and this I need to see in a movie. I'm, I'm, I'm willing this into existence. Okay. 
but absolutely amazing issue. Like I say, if you're into like old school westerns with a horror twist, this is perfect for you. The cover is wild. And like I say, it's, just, it's one of the best series they do. But like I say, everything that they've done with Best Jacket Press and this deal they have with Comixology, Dark Horse Comics, has always been lights out. This is no exception. Like I say, this is one of the best series you're going to read. And like I say, it, it's bittersweet because I love the series, but it had to come to an end at some point. So, uh, Also from Image Comics, Black Market Narrative, one of my favorite series out right now. It's a it's a movement. It's an event. It's a, it's a whole vibe itself. No one... Kyle Higgins, Brian Bustolato, Geraldo Borges is not on art for this issue. Hmm. So Antonio Fuso is uh, stepping in. You know him from uh, House of Slaughter. So he's jumping in for this, um, but still fantastic issue. Major, major ramifications going on with the case of the accountability killer. So if you haven't checked this out, this is perfect to do it. And the podcast uh, companion episode is coming out uh, with this as well today. So definitely make sure to go check that out on your favorite podcast players as well. Also... Image Comics, Skybound Entertainment. This is a series that we were fortunate enough to talk to Joshua Williamson about. Mm. The day is finally here. Duke, number one. Tom Riley uh, on the artwork for this. Uh, with the franchise of the G.I. Joe line is now in his own solo stories. This is all stemming out of the Energon universe and the events of Transformers number two. So you definitely want to go check this out. Um, I'm not even going to kill the lead. I give it a 10 out of 10. Oh, okay. This is absolutely brilliant. Uh, if you like that kind of um, born identity with a little touch of the expendable, so to speak, because it's G.I. Joe, you're going to absolutely love this series. And like I say, one issue in, I'm already hooked. I'm like, this is, this is fantastic. So definitely give that the highest possible recommendation this week. Um, from Image Comics and Skybound. Skybound's doing amazing things, too. Um, so you definitely want to check out everything that they're doing. Last but certainly not least on my list this week, it's one of my favorite series, and this is a, a follow-up to a book that came out last year. Okay. So obviously, if you're a longtime listener, you know I love Something is Killing the Children by Boom Studios, James Tynan. And last year, they came out with this companion book called The Book of Slaughter. Okay. And it focused on a character named Maxine Slaughter. Okay. And the story was involving about her switching um, groups inside the Order of St. George. Okay. And last year, it was a breakdown. Like, the book is a great information piece as well, too, about the history of the different masks inside the Order. It's it, like if you're jumping in to the series, right. it's a great read because it will catch you up to speed. Oh, okay. So if you see anything else that happens, like in House of Slaughter, you'll be able to pick it up easier, in my opinion. Okay. This was the sequel. To Ooh, that, okay. it's called the Book of Butcher, um, which it follows Maxine's travels as she is now taking a new path in the Order, and it's a very interesting take. It does provide a lot of information uh, of a different aspect of the house of the uh, Order, I should say, uh, setting up for something. Uh, I would imagine they're going to be doing another book at some point. Nice, and I know with Tynan writing this. We're playing the long game here. Right. I have a theory I don't want to say on air. Mm. I will say off air. Um, I have an idea what is going on here, and I'm very, very interested to see if this all plays. His theory is Ben Riley. Uh, no, but Ben Riley has actually announced that he does have a series coming. Ooh, I know. Uh, you're picking that up. Um, Maybe. I only caught the news clip of it, so I don't I don't have enough information about it. Okay. But it was um he's still being his villain form. Ah Shism, I think is his name. That's something like that, yeah. Or Chasm. I like honestly, if it's Ben Riley, I usually block it out. Because <laughs> I, I have very strong opinions of the clone saga. Yeah, he does. Uh, or the clone conspiracy, I should say. So but I do know Marvel has something coming out with him next year. Um I, I almost want to say it's him versus Kane. Something like that, yeah. Something. Yeah, yeah, it is, yeah, it is. But, ben, ben Riley versus Kane. Okay, I I did catch some clip of that. And I was like, oh, clones. Nah. Just, I'm staying away from it as of right now. But who knows? I'll probably wind up reviewing it. Probably. It might happen. I have enough people ask about it. But I did have enough people ask me about this one, in Book of Butcher number one from Boom Studios. It's great if you're into something that's killing the children. If you're not into that series now, I highly recommend you do because with the strike now officially over, Netflix, I would imagine, will be start casting soon. You would figure. So you'll start hearing a lot more about the show uh, coming to Netflix in the upcoming year. Uh, so stay tuned for that. But this is a great companion piece to get into it. And as we say with each and every show, 
Make sure you go out and support your local comic shops wherever you're at, especially this holiday season. And if you have a pull list, pay it up before the new year. 100%. Yeah, do not let it carry over. Pay it up. It definitely helps out the shops. It helps you out because you have great books in your collection. And definitely make sure you're going out and supporting small, too. We always like to promote small business here on the ODPH. So that said, it's been a year. We say thank you for supporting us, as you always do. You guys are amazing for checking us out. Make sure to drop that five-star review on your favorite podcatcher. It does help the algorithm. That's it for this week and this year. So for the one and only Padawan J. Fuck the Astros. I'm your host, Ken M. Thank you very much for listening to the ODPH podcast, better known as the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour for 2023. Have a safe and healthy, healthy new year, and we'll see you next year. Such waste of time Swiping left and swiping right On people you could know Cause anyone who's worth a damn Be worth way more than a picture could ever show You can find the right light Find the right angle And never find your soul And it can feel like a losing battle And this plot is full of holes This modern way of finding love Just makes me feel so alone And I can't be the only one Sick of staring at my phone So look up Talk to me A better way to spend our energy Just look up Talk to me time fable everyone has just one true love all i know is you're across this table and you're all i'm thinking of so look up talk to me a better way to spend our energy just look up talk to me Swiping left and swiping right on people you could know